2013, I go to this meet and I have my eyes set on breaking the all time world record total with no f- knee sleeves, like completely raw. Show up at the meet, don't realize that USPA, because I had never lifted in USPA, was a f- walkout meet. I hadn't walked out since USAPL in 2004. <laughs> so I've been doing all these big mm-hmm. lifts and monoliths, you know, and I said, whatever, I'll still do it. I'm already here. Ended up squatting like the third highest of all time. And I ended up with the third highest total of all time, my first raw meet. But my squat knocked my bench and my deadlift to pieces just based on the fact that I was holding the bar for quite a bit longer to walk out. Yeah. And I was starting to lose my conditioning because I was 305 pounds and I wasn't doing warm ups, and I wasn't doing enough volume total for the workout. So... Sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. My guest again is Matt Winning. Congratulations on your doctorate. So we'll just jump off with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, really no need for the intros. Matt's been on podcast 121, 130. I had to take a deep breath first, right? <laughs> 121, 133, 204. Eight and 265. So we're going to try to cover some topics we haven't covered in the past. Yeah. Maybe there'll be some circling back on certain things. Where I'd like to jump off with is some questions from our crew members. I want to thank the crew members. Without those, without you guys, they probably wouldn't have a podcast, you know, right. so it helps supplement the podcast tremendously. <clears throat> so the first one, I'm going to do a few of these when then we'll get into the meat of yeah, sure. what we wanted to talk about. So the first one's congratulating you on your doctorate, which I just kind of did. Yeah. Um, so, um, small habits that you, small habits that you do to maintain the yeah. cascade of negative events that you have in your life and training and so <laughs> forth. Because, well, I, the big thing with that for me is is I've always went to bed early. And I try to tell people this, you know, a lot and they, you know, think I'm full of shit or they don't believe that that's the magic. But in reality, like I've always went to bed, even when I was a kid, like around 8.30, 9 o'clock at latest 9.30. And if I don't, I can feel it in my training within the next three to four training days. Like it's my body just needs that recovery. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge habit that... Not only I think helps control my stress, but also helps um, just reduce overall fatigue because, you know, when I was at my strongest, pushing as hard as I could go physically and mentally, if I didn't have a solid eight and a half, nine, and sometimes 10 or more hours of sleep a day, I just wasn't able to recover. And that's kind of when I knew that my time at the top was limited or it was maxed out was the fact that I'm like. I'm staying in fucking bed for like 11 hours, right? Mm-hmm. And I and I needed it. It's not like I was just being lazy. Um, the next thing for me was, is just the discipline and consistency. I never really let anything get in, in the way of my training, which in some ways now as an older, you know, at 45, I regret a little. Like, you know, you remember me as in my 20s and 30s. It's like, I missed my brother's wedding mm-hmm. because I had in like three weeks, I knew I was going to try to squat 1,200. And I told my brother, I was like, listen, man, like, this is really important for me. And I've been working for this my whole life since I was 12 and a half. I didn't go to my brother's wedding. Did he get it? Uh, Yeah, he did. But his wife still doesn't talk to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, he understood. He's like, fuck it. I get it, man. So I just sent him some money and, you know, Mm -hmm. that was that. Uh, But it definitely, you know, you look at some of the strain and now that like my grandma died in 22, my mom's moved like six, seven hours away. And then you look back and you, you don't realize the golden eras of memories that you could have created with family members that are no longer there. And that is tough for me to swallow sometimes. But I think I was just so goal oriented and driven at that point in my life that it, it, it mattered to me at that time. But that's what allowed me to have a habit of training comes first. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I owed that because for me, I wanted to be the best strength coach I could be. I wanted to be the best, you know, uh, manual maker I could be. And I knew that if I didn't push myself 100% to the limit with no excuses, as in, well, you know, I didn't train yesterday because I had this, or I didn't do that because I had that. How do I really know that my system or my style of training was optimized if I always had these outs? And so for me, I never left an out. And so it was such a drive for me. And I think a lot of that was just being around you guys when I was like in my late teens and saw the dedication that it took to be that strong. And I was willing to do that. 
I think some of it was the, um, at least in my brain, is it wasn't just that one event. You know, if it was a wedding that you missed or whatever it was, it was the fear that that one event would lead to five, six, mm -hmm. seven. So it's, it sounds kind of brutal to say. Yeah. You know? It's breaking <laughs> the habit. But exactly. It's like, well, if I allow this one, yeah. which maybe it's fine, yeah. but then I'm going to allow the birthday party. Then I'm going to allow, you know, the family reunion. Yeah. And then if you go over a summer, it's like every fucking weekend, there's yeah. something going on. I think people can relate to and have family members that maybe are addicted to cigarettes, for example. And they're like, oh, I'll just smoke this one today. And then all of a sudden they're back to a pack and a half a day. Yeah. You know, and to me, that was my training. It was my, it was my drug that was so hard to break, you know, and now it's easier for me, but it still beats the shit out of me. Like I just got back from an East coast motorcycle trip and I didn't train for about a week. I stopped at Gunnar Peterson's place down in Tennessee mm -hmm. and hung out with him for a minute. That was the last time I trained for like eight days and it was starting to like freak me the fuck out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I need to train. I need to train. I need to train. And I'm like, dude, you don't fucking compete anymore. Chill out. Yeah. Enjoy a little bit of life and go walk around. But like people don't realize like I probably pushed a little longer than I should have in the the upper level ranks, but it created, it was almost like it was just, it was, it was insanely habit forming. You know, I, I don't know how to describe how that went, you know, but the more I started to read on that was, you know, AS Mevdiev talks about in, in a book in 86 about missing workouts has, um, you know, a strong effect on um, reducing your motor patterns. So I'm reading this like 15 years ago going, if I miss a workout, my squat form is going to go to shit, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind. Oh yeah. So I'm reading that book and I'm just thinking like, I can't miss, like I can't miss. And you know, would Louis wouldn't take those excuses of why you would miss. And so it's funny that we had so much, you know, like budding heads, but we were so similar in certain ways with that, you know, like mm -hmm. training is everything. And if you're not willing to make it everything, then get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And that's how I treated myself, you know? And I find it's difficult because I know they had questions on there about tactical. And I work with a lot of fire departments in central Ohio, and it's very difficult for me at some times to work with those guys because they don't have the same passion. And I'm not saying they need to be world-class lifters, but hey, man, did you, you know, if I only see the guys every three weeks because each unit day, right? Did you get your workouts in? No, oh, man, I had to do this, that, and this. And then you're okay with it for like two, three times. And then five, 10 mm -hmm. times, you're like, dude, get off your fucking ass, bro. This is ridiculous. And then I have to think for a minute, wait, wait a minute, they're not me, you know? And that is gets difficult to balance like a double-edged sword. You're hired to make them better, but you're also can't push them too hard because they don't look at that as like we do, you know? Yeah. Like if Louie came in and said, you're a piece of shit and you need to work harder, what'd you do? You yeah. worked harder. Yeah. If I do that to them, they're just mad at me. So mm -hmm. it's like a real weird balance beam on that. But again, it comes back down to habits. Most of those guys, and it's weird to think, but you know, most of those guys that are in like, say, and I'm just kind of making it generalized, but like most of those guys that are in those services now, they didn't play high school football. They didn't have a coach up their ass the whole time yelling at them to be yeah. better. And, you know, like in our generation calling you a piece of shit, mm -hmm. you know, now you have to turn in a hurt feelings report. Yes. You know, oh, you hurt my feelings or I feel like, you know, this is, you're being agitated towards me or, you know, you're aggressive. I'm like, no, that's how I grew up. And if I see you fucking up, then that's how you're going to get coached. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't work well. You know what I mean? So going back to when the competing, what would be the perfect day when you were in the mind, that mindset of, yeah. you know, I'm going to miss our, your brother's wedding. And so what would that perfect day look like then? So a perfect day would have been, you know, I get up. I was always an early waker because I was an early sleeper. Yeah. So I'd get up around seven, move around, you know. I was, I always like to do my showers in the morning. Cause I just feel, you know, like get up, get clean, make, make or eat breakfast and then have about 45 minutes, an hour to mentally put my, my mind in the situation of a near fight or flight. So I was very difficult to talk to before I would get to the gym. A lot of that was the nerves that were created in training. I think driving from Indiana to Columbus, Ohio, 
to train with you guys in the late nineties is you're driving over there and you got three hours to think about getting your ass handed to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, you doing and Chuck doing yeah. fucking 10, 12, 15 sets of squats. And then you're doing accessory work until you fucking feel like you're going to die. And then we all go out to eat and then you go home. And it was, uh, so I somehow over the years of doing that, it created this fight or flight mentality. But when I got to the gym, I was already probably sitting at 115 beats a minute. I was already cranked. I was already ready. And then it was all focus. Now, keep in mind for later down the episode, this is pre-winning warm-up. Mm -hmm. We hopped in and we were up to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we were up to near maximal weights within 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, which looking back now may have not been the most optimal thing the more I've read, but it it created a, a great sensation of if you were ever at a meet and for some reason, one of your handlers fucked up and you only had 30 minutes to get ready to squat. That's happened to me more than once mm -hmm. where a meet just goes faster or more people bomb out or more people just, they're on the list, but they don't show their yeah, nerves got yeah. to them. And so there were supposed to be 50 guys squatting and now there's 35 because one dude blew his knee off the other guy, mm -hmm. you know, fucking pushed out and didn't do yeah. it. And so you show up and you're like, Oh, I only got like 30 minutes to get up to like, you know, and my strongest, like a thousand fifty mm -hmm. warm up, and like, dude. So that happened to me in the 06 seniors. You know, when I squatted my first thousand, I had to work up to something pretty fast because it was just such a quick paced meet. And there were so many bomb outs because people were afraid of what they were uh, opening with. Yeah. So, like, if, if you see five or six guys in your weight class and you know, three or four of them are going to hit a thousand, some people try to play the mind game and open up a little too heavy. Because they're like, well, this guy's going to squat more. I need to open up more. It's a bad idea. Yeah, it's a stupid idea. Right? Real, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but we've done it. Yeah, yeah. We've done it, but it's a dumbass idea. So um, so that always prepped me for that. So I'd get to the gym. I was already jacked and ready. Then I'd load up and the workouts, equip days would take much longer because you're putting on shit. But like in the raw days of like 2013 to 2018, uh, you know, that's when the warm up started to kick in, at least year two in the raw training. Because I had sat in a uh, conference over in Australia in 2012, and there was this PhD lady that was working with rugby players, and she was talking about this pre-activation training, and they would do these isolated movements, and they saw performance increases in squatting, deadlifting, or whatever they were going to use as a core movement that day. And I was like, man, I don't do fucking anything before I hit those big movements, you know, because in my mind, just like... Most people you mm -hmm. see that ask questions, well, I'm going to be too tired. Well, I'm going to be fatigued to do my big sets. That's n not the right mindset. Mm -hmm. The right mindset is, are you fit enough to do the proper warm up? Right? Because you should, your fitness level should always be the baseline in which your strength is built upon. Because once you lose fitness and trade it for strength, you don't have either. Yeah. Well, that's called peaking too. Right. Yeah. And that's called peaking, but only for say mm -hmm. three or five weeks a year. If you're doing two meets a year, mm -hmm. you're only doing that to super compensate. You're not really doing that to train. You know, you're training in a deficit almost all the time. So what's the fucking, what's the argument about being in a deficit to hit your core lift? Because if you're a three meat lifter, uh, sorry to tell you, but your bench and your deadlift are at a deficit because if you're any kind of a good fucking squatter, you should be tired after squats. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so. I think what happens sometimes is <clears throat> by accident, say they miss a few training days, mm -hmm. then they go in and just do the main lift, but then they're way stronger. Right. And then essentially they're kind of like peaking without knowing that they're peaking. And then we'll come to the conclusion that, oh, I didn't need all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then slowly, you know, the accessories get pulled out, warm ups get pulled out, yep. whatever gets pulled out to where they're just doing the main lift and just maxing out. Mm -hmm. And because it is funner that way. Well, it's funner that way, but understood, but yeah. for only a short period of time. Yeah. And they don't realize that until that begins to burn itself yeah. out. Yeah. Which know? I wish I would have known, we would have known what we know now. And it had been 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Because I think if we could all sit down and listen to each other, the system that we would have created would have been Dynamo Club level, which it already was from the old West Side system. Mm -hmm. But um, and but really, we were what we were doing was only only touching the surface of utilizing maximal effort and dynamic effort and repetition methods on the surface as good as we knew how. Yeah, and I think that as you dive deeper and deeper into the knowledge and start seeing there were some cracks in what we were doing, um, especially with potentiation warming up 
We could have been doing a lot of the isolation movements that we were doing post core lift. We should have been doing pre lift at a moderate to light level. And that would have helped our motor patterns and our performance even better once our work capacity would have risen to that point. But back to your original question yeah. is I'd go in, I'd hit my big lifts. Right when I got done, it was immediately eat. Like there was no 45 minute window. There was no, I'm going to wait an hour and a half. It was like you're blasting fucking 2000 calories like right now. Mm -hmm. Then it was go home. And if I didn't have to work, it was take a nap. And again, remember, like my lifestyle at that point was if work got in the way of training, work suffered, not training. Mm -hmm. That's not usually the way it goes with normal people. Like, man, I can't miss work. But, you know, we both set ourselves up that way. And I'm, and I'm saying me and you yeah. because we choose a similar work pattern. Like you had to be at, you know, down at yeah. downtown to work with clients and run the mm -hmm. facility. Um can't remember what the name of it is Capital now. Capital Club. Capital <clears throat> Club. And so I set up to where I could put my clients where I wanted them. So usually I didn't start training clients. We were done lifting around 10 a.m. We'd go eat around 1030, you know, wherever we got to eat, 11 o'clock, whatever opened up at that time. And then I'd go home and I'd take a one to two hour nap and I wouldn't start working with clients till around two o'clock. And then I would stop working with clients around 730. And then it was recovery, bedtime, chill. Um, and then I started reading stuff on blue light and I would take away like TV and I would read. You know, that's another big habit that I think that people miss is like, if you really want to progress yourself, and I don't remember the exact saying, but if you only read on a subject that you want to be a master in, read 20 minutes a day for five years and you'll be in the top 2% of that field. It's something like that. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, 20 minutes, so that puts me in the top 5% of my field. What's reading a fucking hour going to do? Yeah. Right? So now I've read an hour for 25, 30 years. I mean, and Louie really sparked that. You know, I get over to West Side at like 19, and he's throwing all this Russian shit in my face. Mm -hmm. And I can't find those books. I don't know where they're at. The internet is in its infancy, if it's even existing at yeah. that point. He's still selling shit on VHS. It's not even mm -hmm. really a DVD level. And I'm like, where in the fuck is he getting these books? And so I end up finding Bud Char Charinga. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the place name? The Livonia Press. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In Michigan. And it was a mail order. And I got my first Verkashansky books and Mevdiev books. And keeping in mind, I'm 19. Yeah, and, how'd that go? Uh, it went fucking horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading it and it's like, it's like a fucking person trying to read something about aeronautics that doesn't even understand mm -hmm. how to put together like a paper plane. Yeah. And I was looking at it going, what the fuck are they talking about? This, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can get into that later, but the perfect day was basically get up in the morning, train, eat, sleep, Again, nap. And then, so now you're looking at 12 hours a day of sleep, four to five hours a day of work, and then back into full recovery mode. And then I would reduce about at 26, I started reading more on blue light and started, we, we went to a, um, an NSCA conference and somebody's topic was blue light. And I remember watching it going, fuck, I need to quit watching TV when I go to bed, which forced me to read. And this is at like 18. So I get those books and I'm starting to read them and I'm, I'm actually just more pissed off when I go to bed because I'm like, I feel stupid because yeah. I'm like, I'm in college for this shit and I don't understand a fucking thing they're saying. Mm -hmm. But over time, over time, they started to make sense. And then it was up and again and again and again. And that was my entire life from 20, I don't know, 23 to to 35, I'd say. And then, you know, the business started to change and and towards the end of my raw career, that's when I started to really see a big increase other than military contracts, which were actually pretty easy because I would do that four or five hours a day. And then I had all the rest of the day to recover and train. The only hard part about that was, is most of my contracts were in Colorado and I was at Fort Carson, which is like an 8,000 foot base. And being 300 pounds out in Colorado at three at 8,000 yeah. feet, I'm telling you right now, is not fucking fun. Mm -hmm. Unless you were born out there and you're just, you know, yeah, but you're yeah, trying to yeah. train, like, dude, ass kicker deluxe. I remember like six, it took me like six or eight weeks to get used to that altitude. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was the perfect day for me though, honestly. And, it, and I loved it because I could just focus on one thing. 
Um, and the other habits were, I just didn't let other people get in the way of my progression. You know, if I had a girl I was dating at the time, or I had, I, it could be a multitude of things. If it got in the way of training, that, that fucking shit was gone. And yeah, it hurt, but it hurt for a day or two, mm -hmm. but it didn't affect my training. You know, and a lot of that hardness, I think, came from watching how Louie dealt with things. Um, but I didn't notice it at the time. I just thought that's what you had to do to be a champion. And so I want to be a fucking champion. So the, the habits, I think, were, it, are you willing to be a champion more than you're willing to put other people uh, down with their needs from you? Mm -hmm. And I did that for a long time, even with family members. And I, in, some, in some ways, now I feel bad about that. Because what you don't realize is when you're living that life of a pro lifter is that I'm really known as a coach now or like, you know, my internet presence slightly or those things, the numbers just come and go. I mean, I'll give you an example on that. Like, and we've talked about this before, I believe we've done enough podcasts. I can't remember, but I'm like at 2016, 2017, I'm walking around the Arnold classic with Eddie Cohen and nobody's coming up to shake his hand. Nobody even knows who the fuck he is. And, and they're coming up to me because I had just broke a squat record and, you know, I was on the front covers of Bell's mm -hmm. Magazine, which was the biggest thing after PLUSA crashed that powerlifting had. And people, oh, hey, it's Matt Winning, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I'm Matt Winning. That's fucking Ed Cohen. Talk to him. You know what I mean? I'm like mm -hmm. pushing people over to him. Oh, I didn't know, you know? And I'm thinking this dude broke 80 world records. I broke like four. And I'm just thinking, man, it's short lived. And that, that was a real big wake up call in 2016 was like, was this sacrifice actually worth what I was doing? Because I'm not going to be left as a Michael Jordan or a Magic Johnson or a Larry Bird or a LeBron, even though in my mind at the time, yeah. that's what it felt like. But I realized that there's only going to be a handful of people in 10 years that remember what I do. And the same thing happened with Chuck. I remember the first time I saw it, but I couldn't digest it. 2010, I opened my own gym. I'm away from Chuck at Lexington, and I've obviously been away from Louie for a couple of years. And Chuck starts having back problems. And you remember this. He goes in and gets rods put in or fusions mm -hmm. on his back. He comes back to try to squat 1,000. It was shaky, and I think that was his last meet he tried. It was just like 2010. And there were some people in the crowd. He'd only been retired for like a year and a half and came back. And there were people in the crowd that had no idea who he was. And he broke 10 world records in the squat. And I'm like, this is a short-lived fucking shit. Maybe all that stuff that I gave up, brothers' weddings and Easter's and Christmases and all this shit, thinking that that was important, when in reality, in five years, nobody gives a fuck. But in my mind, I yeah, cared yeah. then. And that was, fuck, that was a hard one to swallow. Mm -hmm. So what would be the perfect day now? Perfect day now is, you know, training is still the top three. Yeah. Uh, because I'm fucking retarded, but you know, I, but it's different now. I don't place the same emphasis. I'm more, I get up in the morning with more pressure. I think I put more pressure on others, like the people that I can control in my gym as much as possible. Like I want to see them improve, but this, the, the same thing applies. It's just more work at this point. You know, I'm working on a, a couple of manuals that we're going to re release. I'm, um, I have a friend, you know, and you're at, I'm at an age now where my friends have kids that are around 10, maybe five, 10, 12. And I'm realizing that nobody knows how to fucking train at that age. And nobody, mm -hmm. and, and the coaches that are at that age, a lot of them really don't care because they were the cool guy in high school that maybe got looked at in college, but never were superstars. And so they train this real archaic way back in the day. It's, it's funny because I just had this conversation with somebody like a week ago. I go watch my friend's seventh grade junior varsity football, right? And I'm sitting in the crowd and the dad's like, hey, you ought to talk to winning because he's introducing me to the wrestling coach for the school. And the guy's telling me what he's doing with the kids. Like he doesn't want to hear what anything what I have to say and I'm not offering it. Yeah. I'm just listening. And yeah, you know, we do like a normal pyramid method, you know, 10, eight, six. And I'm like, I'm just thinking in my head, like, motherfucker, do you know who's like right here talking to yeah. you? They don't even care. And it's almost like I need to put out manuals for at least what I think is might be the right way to develop at that age, you know, which is, you know, as we talked about earlier before these mics came on, like, there's a lot of theoreticals, books about how to train, but I never seen really any 
like manuals to follow per se. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started digging in the research on that because it's, it's something new. Like, I feel like I've, I don't know everything and I never will, but I think that the, that model of understanding the development of like, you know, mobility and flexibility is created between the ages of five and 10 speed is created between the ages of say like 13 and 18. And you can get better than that after that, but to optimize, yeah. there's optimization periods of time that if you miss, you, there's no way you're going to take those years back. Yeah. I was talking with, uh, you know, uh, half Thor Bjorgesen about this. And so what was your biggest thing you think in development as a child that really helped you? And I don't know how that topic got on board, but I remember this like it was yesterday. And he goes, my basketball coach made us stretch for 30 to 40 minutes a day. You notice how flexible he is, how tall he mm -hmm. is. He can grab a deadlift bar and it looks better than you and I grabbing the deadlift yeah. bar. And I was like, fuck. And he goes, dude, we started that at four years old up until I was 15. So now when he goes down and grabs a deadlift bar, he's not tight. He can get in a good position at six foot eight and he has an amazing deadlift. And I'm thinking, fuck, you know? And then I look back at my production at that time. I'm in a fucking wheelchair with my legs broken. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder why my hamstrings are tight. You know what I mean? And I'm always working on getting them loose. No matter how much I stretch them, they'd get five, maybe eight, 10% better, but they never get 50% better. And it's because I didn't realize what I was doing until I was in my late teens, early twenties. And that was still slightly retarded. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think people don't understand that those developmental blocks, how important they are. Um, I think cardiovascular fitness is even younger. I can remember stories of the Russians throwing babies in pools and when they <laughs> right after they're born or some shit. You know, don't quote me on that, yeah, but die it's low. crazy shit like that. <laughs> but those that was part of that whole developmental process from that very young age is yes, they're using it to kind of steer them to what sport mm -hmm. they're gonna be the best at, but they're taking care of those developmental areas areas during the proper phases and i think maybe maybe we did that in early pe classes where now we don't have pe classes uh -huh. so it's not being yeah. implemented it's not addressed you know and even like visual acuity was something that i got fascinated with years ago just yep. going down that rabbit hole because that can be the difference between a quarterback and alignment Huh? You know, is the ability to be able to take in all that space. Yep. Now, <clears throat> oddly enough, is that being fulfilled with video games on big screens? I don't know. I'm fascinated yeah. by that. It could be. Yeah. It may not be. You know, well, and I found it interesting. You know, if you look at as a whole, you know, and I'm going to use this as, a, as an instance. You know, there's this huge debate now on like basketball. Who's the best, Jordan or LeBron? And you look at Jordan's work ethic and LeBron's work ethic. I don't think we can contest that both of them are equal in that range. Longevity, I give that to LeBron. But you start looking at, um, you know, those areas of competition and you start realizing like today's day, there are far more better athletes than there were in Jordan's era. But on average, there are way more people that are far more out of shape. Yeah. So I think that the reason, and this is a question that I, you know, is my theory. I think the reason that we see so much better athleticism at the top is because the grab from the population is bigger. It's just more people. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that as a standard society that we're in better shape. We're actually fucking worse. No, I would agree with that because I think right. we see that in powerlifting, right? Oh, yeah. So there's a, there's a bigger pool that's mm -hmm. coming into it. So you're going to catch more genetic outliers. Yep. You're going to get those five or you 10 know? more freaks that everybody goes, oh, this guy's now the best in the world. Yeah, it's a bigger net. But mm -hmm. when you look at the average, mm -hmm. you know, then it's not as strong. No. You know, no. when you compare that to the other. So it's, yeah, it's that give and take. I wish we'd have been doing more just data collecting in like the 50s and 60s when I figure America was in its golden era. As far as like we were getting fed well, we still had gym classes. The jobs were at minimum 60 or 80 percent manual labor. We didn't see a lot of mm -hmm. fat asses in 1965, right? Or whatever that date may be. It would have been interesting to see what the average deadlift over, say, the population would have been then versus now. Oh, and God. I'll bet you it'd be half. Yeah. Half. Because even when I was a kid, I still had to go with my grandfather and do all the hay baling. You talk to Kazmaier. He worked with a neighbor that was a logger from the age of like eight to like 16, never seen a weight until he was like a sophomore in high school. 
Did you ever hear that story? Yeah. No, I've not heard that oh one. Oh my God. Yeah. Sorry, I'll yeah. tell you. It's really crazy. But it's on my one of the podcasts I yeah. interview with him, but I remember it. So he he's walking across the gym and there's seniors in there and they're deadlifting. And he walks by and he's, you know, he's a bigger kid and he's, but he's farm boy fucking strong, crazy strong. He said, my hands were like brutal. I mean, if you ever shook Kaz's yeah. hands, you know, it's like a damn catcher's mm -hmm. mitt full of muscle. He walks by and he's just kind of a nice guy. And he's like, Hey, you guys mind if I lift with you? You know? <laughs> and the guys are like, yeah, if you can deadlift this, you can come in and train with us. Like being smart asses. There's 500 on the bar. He grabs it double overhand and just stands up with it. And he's like this much weight. And the guys are like, nobody could lift it. And the guys are like, what the fuck? And he, they go, that can't be real. Put on another plate, 585, double overhand, boom, picks it up. Never seen a deadlift bar. But he'd been dragging logs out of the mm -hmm. woods for like 10 years. He's like, I was used to grabbing stuff that was 12 and 14 inches around and six, eight, 10 feet yeah. long and just working raw through the, through the woods, you know? And he's like, so now I can grab something that's like an inch and a quarter wide and I can just grab that. No big deal. My back was strong enough. My legs were strong enough. And he said, they were just fucking floored. And he goes, I look at them and I see this look of just confusion in their eye. And he's like, and that was the weight bite. Yeah. I was like, now I'm going to fucking train. And you could see his eyes just yeah, go so back to when it. he was 16 yeah. and he's glowing. Like, and I'm like, oh shit, I hit a nerve on that one. But you know what I mean? That yeah. That's the kind of thing that you realize is like back then in the 60s, manual labor was much more prevalent in our society. So the average person walking around was a little bit stronger, but I think that, yeah, you're seeing a bigger pool grab now. So you get more freakish athletes and the nutrition's better. Cause you gotta remember in the sixties, they were only maybe one generation out of the great depression. Yeah. So we were still dealing with some issues on, which that's a whole nother rabbit oh, hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the food guy pyramid. And <laughs> a lot of times people don't realize, and from what I've read before, and you know, there's discussions on this all the time, but the food guy pyramid was really created in order to beef up the American population, because a lot of people don't know this, and I might have the exact number wrong, but a lot of a lot of people were turned down from the military in World War II because they were underweight. Think about it, we're just out of the depression. So if we create a food guy pyramid that kind of gets everybody a little bit more nutrition that's sustainable then we're going to be able to have more people that are of weight that can go into the military. Little did they know by the 70s it backfired. Yeah. Now they're turning people down cuz they're too fucking fat. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a it's a yin yang effect yeah. instead of something happy in the middle. So yeah, it it would be interesting to see, but I think there's just a a bigger pool and that's why you're seeing guys like hack and wheels and stuff like that. You know, there's and I'm not saying those, I'm not taking anything away from those guys. They're amazing to watch, but you watch the new generation of lifters and it's just a bigger pool. I mean, when we were lifting, the number may not be correct, but it was somewhere around 8,000 registered powerlifters in America. Yeah. And now what is it? It's oh, got to be. thousand. Yeah. When I, when I tried to do the best stats I could on that years ago, <clears throat> I was, I remember calling Mike Lambert to get the number of PLUSA subscriptions because I figured that would be a good metric. Yeah. And then a couple of the federations gave me numbers. Most wouldn't, you mm -hmm. know, because they wanted to keep that hidden. Yeah. I came up with somewhere around, this is maybe 20 some years ago, 20,000. Okay. And then Ricky Crane, you know, who just passed RIP, yeah. um, mm -hmm. sent me an email saying that he figured it was about around that same too. Mm -hmm. Cause I was trying to figure out the exact number of multiply versus single ply. Gotcha. And multiply is about 4,000. Which in 20 years ago was a huge draw because there really wasn't raw back then for no it was multiply and single ply that was it yeah you know so the multiply feds untested feds mm -hmm. that'd probably be a better way to explain it at the time was around four thousand. yeah where now if you go to open power lifting and just click raw with sleeves and scroll down oh man and then add those up it's I would guess around 200,000, mm -hmm. you know, so a growth of tenfold. And, Easily. Yeah. And the multiply is probably still about the same as what it was. Yeah. It's kind of that. Right. That, so it's, yeah. That it's that. So it hasn't. Redheaded stepchild. Yeah, it hasn't died. <laughs> right. But it hasn't but it's grown close. at the same right. rate as the other. So it's, and that's a lot of factors kind of play into that, mm -hmm. you know, popularity, social media, CrossFit, a lot of things play into, sure. you know, that being in there. Yeah. Where, and, and again, like we were talking about earlier with hypertrophy training versus performance training, performance training for most people is unrelatable. 
right? Like most people in the gym are not getting in there to jump higher or run faster or squat a world yeah. record. They're in there because they want their biceps to look good at the fucking club. So when I tell people don't do biceps because it's going to fuck up your shoulder, I'm the asshole because then that just screws up everybody's three day a week arm training, right? Yeah, yeah. Instead of, hey, he's trying to save my shoulder and make my bench better so that long term my arms can grow and I don't be, I don't have the issues that I would have 10 or 15 years down the road where I'm getting shoulder replacements and I'm getting, you know, rotator cuff tears because my bicep tendon is basically anteriorly rotated in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's a whole nother tangent, but yeah, you're exactly right. So the pool grab is so much bigger that it allows to find, find those bigger freaks. Yeah. I'm going to change topics here because yeah. this person here is asking if their weak point is their upper back mm -hmm. and how to go about specializing yeah. and building that up. Okay. Well, I mean, the key is, and this is just, again, <laughs> you know, after my doctorate, now everything is an opinion. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> uh, it depends. Uh, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't train that muscle more than every 72 hours for long-term development because you might be able to get gains faster training at more frequency, but you're going to create overuse problems. So 72 hours is kind of that golden rule that Zatsiorski set since the 60s. And usually if somebody's willing to break that rule, I'm automatically unsure of what they know. Because to me, that 72 hour rule is important. So now we know we could probably only train it twice a week. The next thing is, is that you're going to want to do something that's high volume. And then one day that's a little bit higher intensity, the 72 hours later. The next thing is because the upper back can be so overpowered from the bicep and the arm musculature, you might be better off doing tempos, 3-3, three, 2-2, three, two -two, or maybe even like a 2-2-2, two -two -two, which would be two seconds, two second mm -hmm. hold, two second back in order to start creating a motor pattern of not using your bicep when your back should be doing the work. Because I will tell you this, over the last 20 years of really focusing on back work and then people messaging you back and going, hey, I'm doing your four sets of 25 lat pull downs, but my bench isn't going up. And then, you know, send me a video. And I'm looking at the video and it's all fucking bicep and brachialis muscles. It's not, mm -hmm. you, don't see, you don't see any creasing in the back. You don't see the shirt bonding you don't see the shoulder blades coming together and you're like you're not doing fucking pull downs you're doing bicep work mm -hmm. because you have probably started the gym by doing i want to look good with my arms at the mall and now you're trying to isolate an area like the upper back but the arms have to come into play for 99 percent of those exercises and now your arms are overpowering your back muscles and that's probably why they're not growing. If I'm just throwing a fucking yeah. free throw in the dark. Yeah, 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 yeah. The intent is not there. The intent's not there. And the muscle coordination from the brain to where you're trying to work isn't there, which, you know, we can call it anything scientific. Sure. I call it Yoda phase. Like when you and I, if we go and squat right now and you're like, Matt, you need to use more hips. I know how to do that. Yeah. But you give that to an amateur or a beginner. There, they might understand what you're saying, but relaying the information neurologically to the muscle tissue is not going to be there. So again, motor unit control, being able to tell the muscle, I don't want you to use your biceps for this back work. I want you to use your upper back. So I would, I would strongly recommend taking a look at what you're doing and looking at the volume, looking at the tempos. Again, I'm a variety guy. I've looked at yeah. the variety of the exercises and then asking yourself, are those exercises actually hitting the areas you want? Just because you're doing an upper back exercise may not mean you're using upper back muscles to do it. You find that tempos work most of the time? I find that tempos work for questions like that because what you'll find is that tempos, if you slow something down, the body is more likely to utilize that exact area that you're trying to hit, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and not always. And again, why is it so important to have a master coach around? Because I'll give you a prime example. I did a seminar during the Arnold in March and we did a bench. I want to say it was a bench seminar on Friday and a deadlift seminar on Saturday. And these guys were avid followers. Like they've been following my YouTube. They've been following my Instagram. They've been watching my videos. So they had a larger grasp of what I was doing than the average person. They get there and I, this is an example, they're doing rope tricep pushdowns. And I told 
my training partner, Rob, big Rob and me were there coaching. And I said, don't say anything to them the first round. I want to see what they're doing. Don't, don't fix anything before we see if they're doing it wrong. They're doing tricep pushdowns and their shoulders are just every fucking one of them. They're rolling that anterior delt to make the anterior delt help the tricep. And then we corrected them on round two and they're like, holy shit, my triceps are on fire. Are both of them tricep extensions? Absolutely. Yeah. Is one of them isolated in the area you're trying to hit? Yes. And the other one? Fuck no. And so the problem is, is that although you might understand what somebody's saying, to actually recruit what you're trying to do is a much different process and why, especially in the intermediate and beginner phases, you need to have a pro looking at you and correcting you. I would have never been the lifter I would have had if George Halbert wouldn't have said, hey, Matt, I know you're training hard, but your triceps fucking suck, mm -hmm. right? Or like, you're, yeah. you know, me with squats. Hey, Matt, your squat's pretty strong, but your knees are fucking over your toes and you're going to blow your fucking kneecaps off. And instead of going, well, you know, fuck Dave Tate, you don't know yeah. what he's talking about. I'm, I go back and accept the fact that I need technical work and then I fix the shit. I find that, and you've seen this as long or longer than me, People that are in the beginner stages are too afraid to find a professional because they don't want to show what they don't know. Meaning like, I'll wait and get stronger. I'll come to my learn to train seminar with Dave when my bench is another 50 pounds yeah. stronger. Oh, so you mean your bench is another 50 pounds more fucked up because <laughs> your technique <laughs> sucks now. Yeah. And now we got to take five steps back to go one step forward versus two. Mm -hmm. And it's like nobody fucking listens, right? Yeah. And it kind of comes down to another area that I think is important, like, and I'm a car guy, so it's, you know, for some people, it's going to be hard to digest. But if I come and I'm a billionaire and I say, hey, Dave, here's a brand new top of the line Ferrari, $2 million Enzo. And I'm like, let's go to the racetrack. And you got extra time to burn. Are you going to go to a Formula One guy and you got money too? And you're, are you going to go to a Formula One guy so that dude can teach you how to drive that car so you don't look like a fucking idiot on the track? Or are you just going to show up and be like, hey, I'll just drive this two and a half million dollar car and possibly wreck it into the wall or fucking tear up the car? Get my point? Yeah, yeah. The body is the same way. And we look at cars like value. This car is worth this. When in reality, our body is worth way more than that. But we're willing to do poor motor patterns because of either our ego or our educational level is not up to par. Yeah. But if we want to go do something with our friends that we don't want to look like a fucking idiot, we go get professional help to do it. But we don't do that with training. It just blows my fucking mind. Yeah, I get it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no, I, no, I totally get it. You know, like I want to, I don't want to look like an idiot. So I'm going to go study this and I'm going to have somebody maybe take a class and learn some things. And then I'll show up. Yeah, because the, the technical aspect applies to more than just the big three lifts. Because you pointed out the upper back work, the tricep work, yeah. all those things. Yeah. And then once you master the technical aspect, then you can master how you're going to do that lift. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, basically what I should have probably got my doctorate in was special education. Because now I can fix fucking problems that people, it's like, bro, like to me, it's just so simple. But it's so complex because people don't think, they don't have the same wiring like of how you analyze a problem and how to fix it. And so as you and I both push higher levels of thought and reading, the average person is probably never going to open up that book and they don't care that much. They just want now. And that's hard. But yeah, that was a huge eye opener with my... Uh, with my seminar that time is I'm, I see these people have watched my video because I ask them before we start, you guys watch me doing tricep pushdowns, right? Blah, blah, blah. And I don't give them any real, like, you know, in-depth information beforehand, yeah. but I was, oh yeah, yeah. We do tricep work just like you do all the time. And then walk away and then watch what they're doing and then realize that they're doing a anterior shoulder rotation. They're not mm -hmm. doing a fucking tricep pushdown, yeah. which means you got to put what I call unfuckable exercises into your programming. Right. So like if I do a tricep pushdown, but it's cross body yeah, with yeah. the cable, mm -hmm. far less anterior delt, even if you try to use it, it's not going to help. And so you start picking exercises that are dumb proof. And not that the people are dumb, they just don't have the connection yet. No, I get it. It'd be the difference between like a chest supported row mm -hmm. versus a dumbbell row. Yeah. You, it, or a bar, let's say you do a bent over barbell row. You and I have both seen this a thousand times. Somebody starts to get tired and they start standing up. They don't, they're not hitting the lats anymore. They're pulling with their traps. 
They're using muscles. They're bending their back. You put them on a reverse incline with something forced to where they can't move, then isolate. You can really only use compound movements that can be fucked up when you already have motor control. Mm -hmm. You know, like you and I, if we go do a heavy bent over row, we're either not going to do it or we're going to do it right, but we're not going to do it fucked up. Yeah. Because our brain knows that's that's not the right way. But if you don't know the right way, and you haven't been greasing that right way with multiple sets and reps with trained eye or either, you know, anything like that, you're going to, you're going to create a poor motor pattern, which makes you go backwards to go forward. Well, it could show the importance of putting in more isolation movements for beginners. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just for that reason alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Which kind of gets to my point is that's why we do two isolated movements in the winning warm up because the two isolated movements if done correctly should start to potentiate proper motor patterns or reinforce mm-hmm. for people who don't know potentiation but if reinforce proper motor patterns is probably one of the top 3 reasons why the winning warm up should be implemented in your training is because it teaches you not to fuck up well just to revisit that so people understand completely because i've seen some people on how they <laughs> Yeah. Use that in and some of that could be my fault. I'll is, tell you what. It's way too the, the weights they're using are way too heavy. Yeah. You know, so what what's the weight range they should be using and then the intent that should be applied. So we base everything, and I learned this fire service wise, RPE, rate of perceived exertion. 10 is the hardest fucking thing you can do. Your warm-ups, 75 to 85% of the time should be around a three RPE. So how do you anchor that with that beginner then? So you anchor it with the beginner by starting off extremely light. Like I'm talking okay. like this feels like a very light burn. Like I can feel it working, but I'm not tired. So that's why people when you know, I saw the question that you had and it was like, I don't know about doing this because of the fatigue from the core lift. What automatically tells me you don't know the weights you should be using. That in some cases could be my fault because at my strongest, I was doing warm-ups with hundred pound dumbbells for four sets of twenty-five in twelve minutes. Mm-hmm. But I was benching 225 for close to 70 reps and maxing at 620. Yeah. So that's percentage wise, 225 was 30%, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So although 225 might look heavy to you or be heavy to you, it wasn't heavy to me at that time. Can I do that now? Fuck no. I use like 30s because I bench like 530 now. You know what I mean? So I'm using 30 pound dumbbells to bench 530, and you see other people using 60 pound dumbbells to bench 185. Well, then that would lead to this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, yeah. it would lead to the problems that they're seeing. Yeah, you're you're activating and potentiating. You're not frying. Yes, that that's. I mean, you know, that that's really the 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 key point of that. So, so with the intent, you need to be feeling it in the muscles that are supposed to be doing the movement. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at so how did I get to those warm up percentages and ideals? Well, um. Reading the books that I had at 19 that I did not understand, but I started to pick up pieces, you start seeing Alexiev and Pachenko. Now, for those of you guys that don't know, Alexiev broke 80 world records in Olympic lifting, and Pachenko broke his record and underneath the table because the Olympics were boycotted the years that the Russians couldn't be there. He broke Alexiev's record at like 50 kilograms lighter. He did like a fucking 585, like clean and jerk. 50 kilograms lighter than Alexiev. I mean, what the fuck? Yeah. Bro. (laughs) Right. He did it at like 230 and Alexiev, 240, something like that. And Alexiev was doing that at 380, some shit. And you're like, what? Insane. So basically, he was Lasha before Lasha. He just didn't get, Pashenko didn't get the recognition Mm -hmm. because the Russians basically boycotted him and then threw him under the bus on a drug deal in Canada. Yeah. So uh, other than that, because I know people (laughs) wanted some backstory. Yeah. 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 Um, I started seeing this Alexiev became Pachenko's coach and they hated each other, but Alexiev would do a 55, 50-ish pound kettlebell swing, figure eights, snatches, cleans, whatever movement he wanted to do for 15 minutes nonstop at 360, 380 pounds. Imagine the GPP. This is before he touched a barbell. So for people that tell me, I don't know about Matt's warmups, man, they just wear me out. So- a guy on the surface that looks like a complete fat ass, it's 380 pounds, <laughs> can swing a 50-pound kettlebell for 15 minutes straight before he touches a barbell, and you're fucking tired from my warm-up? <laughs> Bro. Right? Yeah, yeah. Then he does the same thing with Pachenko, and Pachenko had way more muscle than 
he was he kind of started off in bodybuilding, but he had to do it under the ground because bodybuilding was banned in Russia due to their communistic views. They thought of it as a Western phenomenon mm-hmm. due to the Arnold push and all this stuff. But Pachenko looked like a fucking beast. And so I started my point to hold that was 15 minutes. I start seeing this this light bulb go off. Okay, I can withstand 15 minutes before, right? So there, there's a time limit. So I see this and I'm like, okay, 15 minute warm up, but it doesn't plug in yet. Then I start having talks with um uh Flex Wheeler. And Flex Wheeler, I'm like, hey Flex, you know, I'm feeling like I need more volume in my training, but I can't put it after my core lift because I'm too waxed. Um, I'm thinking about preloading before lifting. He didn't understand jack shit about power thing. Yeah. But what he said was, he goes, man, I never saw more gains in muscle tissue and felt better than doing sets of 20, 25. Okay. So if I'm doing sets of 20 or 25, the intensity of that range probably isn't enough to affect a one rep max if done light enough. Then I start going into, um, basically, uh, we start working into GPP. So in 2013 is the first year I start to see that I may need these winning warmups, but I don't know what they are yet. Cause I haven't designed them. 2013, I go to this meet and I have my eye set on breaking the all time world record total with no fucking knee sleeves, like completely raw show up at the meet. Don't realize that USPA, cause I had never lifted in USPA was a fucking walkout meet. I hadn't walked out since USAPL in 2004. <laughs> So I've been doing all these big lifts mm-hmm. and monoliths, you know, and I said, fuck it, whatever, I'll still do it. I'm already here. Ended up squatting like the third highest of all time. And I ended up with the third highest total of all time, my first raw meet. But my squat knocked my bench and my deadlift to pieces just based on the fact that I was holding the bar for quite a bit longer to walk out. Yeah. And I was starting to lose my conditioning because I was 305 fucking pounds. And I wasn't doing warm ups and I wasn't doing enough volume total for the workout. So back to the drawing board, I'm driving home and I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, my first meathead thought process is I just need to be stronger. And then that 2012 post act or pre-activation potentiation shit from Australia kicks into my head. And then the Alexia 15 minute warm up with a 50 pound kettlebell kicks into my head. Then the fact that I need more GPP in order for the squats to not not knock my dick in the dirt for the bench and the deadlift kicks me in the head. And now I start emulating this system of what I consider right at that point, very archaic style of winning warm-up. There's no, there's these guidelines, but I don't understand it. So I had just benched like 589 and the year before I had done 600 at just a bench only meet. That was right across the street from the old Westside Barbell. Mm-hmm. That was when Mike Wolf and everybody, we were all going to compete against each other because Wolf wanted to bench 600. Um, George Halbert George. wanted to take McDonald's record at like, it was like 589 at like 198. He ends up blowing his shoulder off during that training cycle. And then I want to hit 600 because at that time I would have been like the 13th guy to ever do it. And I think like only the seventh guy to ever do it under 300 pounds. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is a good goal. This is fun. I'm, I'm kind of fucking done with the equipped shit. I need a new goal that's bench 600. Because I mean, how many guys at Westside Barbell could legitly bench 600 in a meet? Mm-hmm. I mean, of all time. And you're talking maybe like Kenny Patterson, Halbert. George. And now you're getting rough. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Rob. Maybe. 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 Yeah. I, and yeah, I would say yeah. I gave him 585. Yeah. Yeah. From what I saw. Mm-hmm. But point being is there weren't very many. And I knew that I was only four years removed from Westside. That really fucking punched Louie in the nuts. It's like Matt just missed 600 raw. And man, I kicked him out four years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was right across the street from his gym. And so some of that was a drive mm-hmm. too. So I end up going, I bench 600 raw and I know I got it. And then that's what drives me to go for John Kovacs or Tim uh, Kovacs. Yeah. What's his first name? Ron, Jim. Uh, Dave. It'll come to me in a minute. Kovacs. Mm. D- Dave Co- No, Dan. D- Dan Kovacs. Yeah. 2202. So 2200 fucking raw was like the fucking gold standard of badassness because the world record at that time of all time was Don Reinhold, 2293. In 1976, nobody touched it. And so I'm looking at this going, I think I can do this. And so all of this stuff starts to accumulate. So I don't understand the warm up yet. I go to 2013. I know I can already bench 600. 
I squat like close to 800 and just a fucking belt walked out. And then my bench falls to like 581 or whatever that kilo jump is. I try 610 and it fucking staples me. And I'm like, what the fuck? I just benched like 570 for a triple in training. I thought maybe 622 would have been there roughly. And as I'm driving home, I'm thinking it's a, it's a, it's a strength problem. You know, just like all of us would yeah. go to in our mind. And then the next thing I know that pre-activation potentiation shit starts kicking in my head. Alexiev's extensive 15 minute warm up. Flex Wheeler telling me about 20, 25 reps and muscular development. And then I start seeing all this stuff on, um, I start seeing all this stuff on ligament and tendon development at low intensity, higher volume. And I'm like, I don't fucking ever do anything around 2025 ever. So now I'm looking at this spectrum of loading and I'm seeing that I'm missing this huge gap, not in maximal effort or dynamic mm -hmm. efforts. I was doing what Prolopin's chart was mostly saying, but I didn't have anything high volume where I was creating any conditioning. Added in 30 pound dumbbells. Keep in mind, I'm benching 600. 30 pound dumbbells to 45s was roughly what I was, was rotating and waving. And then 2014, I go and I bench 606 after squatting the all-time world record. And now, I, now in 14, I start implementing with, with the squats and the lower body shit because I'm just experimenting with the bench. And now the bench is there. Yeah. Right? 2015, I barely missed 903 on the squat. And then I end up benching like 611. And I'm like, oh, my God. If I'd have fucking known this like eight, 10 years ago, right? And uh, But again, at that time, it, it, just like now, it's too complex for me to tell people how to do it because people do it wrong. And uh, so keep in mind, anybody that's listening, 35-pound dumbbells for a 600-pound bench. So you probably should be using 15s. Yeah, 10s, 15s. 12s. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're fairly strong, 25s, it's a warm-up. It's not meant to beat your ass. It's meant to correct ligament and tendon density, keep you bulletproof. It's meant to make sure that your work capacity is going up, and it's not meant to degradate your main lift. If you remember those three points, you got about 99% of it fixed up. Yeah. Well, the one interesting takeaway from all that is when you were talking about getting those books when you're 18, mm -hmm. you know, and reading through that, a lot of people that I know, they'll read one resource, but then they'll never revisit it. Mm -hmm. When you revisit the same yes. resource, sometimes every 15 or 20 years, you're seeing things from a different perspective, mm -hmm. you know, Big so time. then, you know, what you may have just discounted before, huh? because it wasn't talking about the 90% plus or whatever, because yeah. you're going to zone in on whatever you're focused on. Sure. Then when you look at it from that different perspective, you're seeing it completely different than when or, you first saw it. not even a different perspective. I would call it an applied perspective. You're not only trying to read it, you're trying to emulate it. You're trying to live it. And then all of a sudden those words turn into reality. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not magic making these books magic, but what they are is they're almost written to the fact you want to know this information, fucking live it. And then you'll start to understand it. But if you're not living what we're trying to say here, good luck. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think you need yeah. to have to absorb the information from a certain aspect of that you are applying this information. And so I go back and then 1974, you see Abedev, you know, the guy that was the coach for the Bulgarian team and his other trainer, Fernandev, they talk about execution of core movements, right? Requires special movements to protect both internal and external motor unit coordination, forming foundations for the following main exercise. What the fuck does that mean? It means winning warmups. Like in my mind, I'm like, so you're telling me you do exercises in pieces that form a foundational motor skill for a complex movement, which is pieces of the movement, i.e. probably your weaknesses, structuring them in so that the body knows how to neurologically control those muscles and then fire them in a compound movement. What's the difference between a clean and jerk? a snatch or a deadlift or a squat, they still use multiple muscles in multiple positions, meaning that I think the clean and jerk and the snatch are much more complex in their understanding, but the Russians were smart enough to break it into pieces and not try to just wear out the same exercise. Whereas Medvedev talks about in about 85, 86, about having 100 exercise selection for two lifts. Well, fucking powerlifting's three lifts. So in reality, less coordination, but far more muscle activation, in my opinion, based on the fact that you're hitting muscles in the bench press that are not going to be hit in the clean and jerk or the snatch. The deadlift is going to hit way different muscles than 
the squat. And if you look at the snatch and the clean, other than what the weight's doing and the percentage of the weight used, they're very similar motor patterns. They're just different movements. So they're both squatting. They're both in a position where the bar's in the front of them. So some of the mechanics of them are similar. I'm not saying they're the same. Mm-hmm. They're similar. So you have, a, you have two similar exercises that you're using in the Olympics and you have a hundred fucking variations, but Matt's program is too variable. What the fuck? Yeah. Well, that would be one of the criticisms that comes with that is that the, the complexity. Yes. And the accessibility. Yeah. So if you look at complexity, um, it's not really that complex. You have three major core areas of mindset when you're laying down to write these type of workouts, whether it's my manuals or online coaching or you're asking me a question. A, does it affect ligaments and tendons and passive tissues to make sure that they're only not being developed, they're also being restored? Winning warm-ups take care of that. B, is max effort and dynamic effort in the core lifts being addressed so that all forms of the force velocity curve are being used? Check. We're either doing speed work or heavier work. C, is the accessory work that we're picking directed towards a weakness and structural hypertrophy, not just fucking shit we want to do? Check. Accessories are based on weaknesses. There you go. So tell me how fucking complex that is. Yeah. Well, if it's a beginner, right, there's yeah. going to be like a Louis quote. and It's all weak. Yes. It's all weak. It's all weak. But the problem is, is your technical capacity in the core lift should be an assessment tool, not an explanation of strength tool in the beginning. Meaning if I'm squatting and some technical aspect of that squat is not being addressed or not being or showing itself in that main lift, why are those technical deficiencies not being addressed in the accessory work? So my point being is if your hamstrings are weak, say in the squat, right? Why the fuck are you doing leg extensions after you squat? Well, how would they know their hamstrings are weak? So in my opinion, and again, this is just an opinion, uh, you know, I kind of switch away from beliefs to opinions yeah. now, but my opinion is you're normally going to see the person's not going to want to sit back. They're going to want to go straight fucking down. And straight down is not going to require hamstrings. I find it interesting that people go, well, this research article says that squats really don't use hamstrings that much. You go back and look at the Bulgarian and Soviet books from their EMG activities with proper technique on a back squat, which most of them say to learn how to squat vertical shank before you learn knee over toe for generalization. And they're showing 60 to 70% activation in the hamstring. Same thing with uh, like Durlacher, I might be saying his last name, Durlacher's weightlifting book says the same goddamn thing. And this is like in 1988 when he wrote that book. And so what you start seeing is like, if you learn how to squat correctly, then you're going to use more muscle tissue. But we both know this is if we're, if we're reading a Western training article or science paper, and then we go down to the people use, it's recreational motherfuckers was horrible technique. And the average biomechanist or person doing the study doesn't have a fucking clue what a good squat looks like. So throw those fucking papers out the window, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just in my opinion, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like just because something feels natural the way you do it with no training doesn't mean it's right. You know what I mean? Like skilled people know what's right. People that have done it a long time with heavy loads and not got hurt knows what's right. Possibly the way you naturally bend is not really that conducive for fixing weaknesses. What it's doing is hiding weaknesses. The body really likes to use whatever motor pattern is most efficient in your brain at that time. So what do people do in the beginning? They bench with their fucking shoulders because that's all they know how to use. They don't know how to use their triceps. So Louie, although very right, is a beginner. Everything's fucking weak. Motor patterns are not equal though. So we're not talking about muscle weaknesses. We're talking about correcting motor patterns. And that's what the warm up attempts to help if they're done correctly, right? So that's kind of the issue with that, in my opinion. Well, that plays into uh, the the application of this to non powerlifting athletes, uh-huh. right? Because that's the other kick towards the conjugate is it's all for powerlifting. It's not for non powerlifting. Well, okay, athletes. so let's let's look at um let's look at Bonder Chuck's literature on throwers, both shot put, discus, and hammer. Does that look similar to you? You've read those books. Yeah. What does it look like? Well, con- <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. What? The conjugate, the same thing. It looks like conjugate? Yeah. So mm-hmm. you're telling me that Bonderchuk, 
which was at, at bare minimum a silver, maybe gold medalist in throwing, becomes a coach for the Russian team and utilizes an Olympic weightlifting, not powerlifting, an Olympic weightlifting conjugated rotated system for throwers and then creates possibly the strongest throwing team as a whole that's ever been created. So tell me how that fucking works again. And then let's talk about Charlie Francis. Why the fuck did he have him squat? Why did he have Ben Johnson squatting three times body weight two weeks before the Olympics when he breaks the world record in running? What does squatting have to do with running? Why would he do that? Because Charlie Francis and you and I, I think both sat in the same fucking conference when he said this, is Ben Johnson already knew how to run. There was no gain in him running more. He needed to be stronger. So when you're dealing with, say, the track athlete, it's a little more segmented than say the football player because they they have a longer off season. Mm -hmm. uh, so how would their off season differ from in season? So in season is going to be a little bit more specific to the throwing modality. So what you would do is start off and I'm just throwing sure generalities. You'd start off with somewhere between a 70 to 100 exercise system because you want to build a pyramid base. Then as the competition start to get closer to realization, things start to turn a little bit more specific while understanding that you're maintaining a base. So if you read, uh, I think one of the best books to describe that, honestly, is probably Cal Dietz's um, The Triphasic System, because he shows like how long does maximal effort strength actually stay? And it's somewhere around like a month. Like you, you can yeah. train it and it'll last a month, but speed work only lasts like seven to 10 days. So now if you know how long those parameters are enhanced for the time period that they'll sustain themselves, you start realizing what's important. So the first thing you would do is take previous year's training cycle, like their best throw. You would have a biomechanist or a very good coach at that level depict where this person's weaknesses are, not their strengths, their weaknesses. If it's GPP, if it's, you know, maybe it's a technical weakness, whatever. So Those, now this is becoming more broad than that power lifter with just the one lift that you're using as ab technique. Absolutely. Yes. So it, whether it's a hundred meter track or pole vault or whatever, where are their structural weaknesses or what are they having tr problems controlling? Then you start to have a really good idea of probably which way you need to go with their training to fix those particular parameters. Because if we have... If we have a structural weakness issue, those issues can take anywhere from 12 to 36 months to fix. Now, can they be blinded by the results of just the neural application yes. of putting it in from the first? Well, the problem is, is you, your neurological system adapts to training very quickly. Yeah. So you're talking one in two weeks coming back to conjugate. So if my nervous system adapts to training within a matter of weeks, why wouldn't we train the stimulus so the CNS gets a break, but the muscles still get work? Well, the pushback would be the it will adapt to that movement. So if you put a new movement in, that movement just neurally is going to become more technical and more efficient because it was put in, but then you'll pull it out mm -hmm. before you really get stronger. But if we know that there are lag times and how long that movement enhances something else, that's where the magic happens. Yeah, got it. So you're getting these delayed transformation points, right? So just because I squatted heavy and broke a PR doesn't necessarily mean my body's ready for another PR the next week, but it's in a developmental process of maybe in a month or two, maybe three, we take it again and now it's up another two, three percent. Well, I think that's part of what's being lost is how long that motor ability will maintain yeah. after stimulation. Well, and that's the problem is everything that we're talking about right now is delayed gratification. It's not immediate. So if we're talking track, you know, we have an indoor and outdoor field, you know, uh, competition. So we're really only training for a various amount of meets at a certain period of time, which does help the conjugate scenario when you're only trying to peak a couple of times a year. But in reality, if you know where your weaknesses are and you're focusing on those and you're making sure that you're training vast arrays of the force velocity curve, just like Vorbiev and a lot of these other guys talk about, making sure you're not missing. Verkashansky was one of the first ones I saw about that. Um, you're not missing any part of the force velocity curve. You're, you're doing about the best you can. Everything else is left up to specifics and genetics. Well, the, the other thing that happens with the in-season, off-season parameters mm -hmm. is they're – 
SPP, the work that their coach is having, the yep. foot contacts or however you want to measure that mm -hmm. is increasing. Mm -hmm. You know, so some of the training stimulus may move from what you're doing to yes. track or field. Yeah. And you got to remember if you're working something that's already really good, right? Like you're really good at a certain particular part of or as a whole the movement. Your ability to get better at that is marginalized because you're already at genetic peak. Mm -hmm. But if you know where those weaknesses are lying and they're down and they're 15% weaker than they should be, there's your magic bullet. Because now that rises. It goes back to Lieberg's law of minimum, which we've talked about before. And that was based in agriculture. But Mel Siff and them said, you know, switching of modality helps ample work of the muscles and recovery of the CNS. So if we know which muscles we need to focus on and we know which motor patterns might be deficiencies and we have multiple ways to attack it, we should see a progression in the motor pattern without actually doing it all the time. You don't lose anything as long as you're focusing in the right area. And that's the hardest thing with periodization is you, delayed gratification, super compensation, understanding that the body has different delayed periods of when you see success in something from something, you know, just because you did something on Monday doesn't mean the next Monday it improved. It might be five, 10, 20 days until it actually sparks itself. Again, mm -hmm. read Cal Dietz's triphasic book and you start going, oh shit, this is what he was talking about, right? Like if I focus on isometrics, it helps concentrics. If I focus on eccentrics, it helps isometrics. They all help each other. It's the same thing with max effort, dynamic effort, repetition method, is all of those methods feed each other, which one is your problem? Now, that's the one that needs the focus. And now you maintain other areas while you're gaining in others because you can't gain everything because of car, right? So if you look at um, current adaptation reserves is what the Russians talk about. That is what your body's energy system can actually utilize to make something better. And once you drain that or gas it out, you, you don't have any more energy to do. It's like, you know, if you have a cup of water and that Rep, replicate your energy system level or how much energy you can burn in say a week or a day in training and you take it beyond that, you're not going to progress from it. So optimizing training either in time, intensity, duration, or volume is going to be crucial because you can't recover from possibly a workout that you're doing just because it looks good on paper. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So you have to know what your anabolic reserves are, you know, what, what becomes catabolic at a certain point, and then say, this is the limit, and now I need to recover from that. And it, you can only put most of your energy in the weakest links, because if you put your energy in your strengths, you've just capped the energy you can use in your weaknesses. Well, that would fall back into how does one determine that? Well, that's the hard part. I mean, how's it going to manifest in them to be I able to know? I think the easiest way is technical proficiency, right? Somebody benches and you see their elbows just cock way the fuck out when they come up. You know, their anterior delt is trying to do most of the work and their triceps are either neurologically or muscularly knowing that they're not, they're not up to par. So they're going to turn on other shit or you've reinforced a bad motor pattern for so long that it just knows to go to that and fight or flight. So how would you know if it's fatigued or weak? Um, well, I think that at certain cases, especially in beginner and intermediate, they're almost one in the same, right? Fatigueness yeah. and weakness are not equal, but they're brothers. You know, and so I think once you get up to a certain point of someone's max, say a beginner, you get up to say 85, 90%. Those things, no matter how good of a coach you are, those things are going to come back and they're going to, you're going to see them immediately. But my point being is if you're seeing a structural weak point and you know that that's probably where the limiting factor is, the Lieberg law minimum, then why aren't you putting all your energy into that point versus trying to keep all these other areas that you may like to train or exercises that you know, because you don't want to get more educated. Those areas are draining the energy and where it should be going. Yeah. So if they're, if Does they're more, sense? yeah, in, in a way, but if they're more advanced, if we're looking at it from yeah. that standpoint, that breakdown may be happening just because they're too fatigued or their GPP's off. Mm -hmm. It may not necessarily be, it's still a weak sure. point, right? Yeah. But it's a different way of addressing that weak point. So it goes back to what you're asking like, are winning warmups good for beginners? Absolutely. Because GPP, ligaments and tendons, I mean, you and I both know, like, how many people in the last 20 years had to stop their lifting program because they actually tore a muscle versus they fucked up something passive, like a ligament or a tendon, mm -hmm. or they broke a bone 
or they fucked up a vertebrae or a disc. Those aren't active tissues. Those are passive tissues. So my question would be, what are you doing in your training program to make sure as a beginner that those areas are catching up as fast as the active tissue that's being fired? Because um, if you look at active and passive tissue adaptation, a lot of people always, where's your references for this bullshit? And again... <laughs> They're hard to find and they are, they are minimal, but they are there. So McDonough and Davies in 1984 said muscle adapt in a matter of days, whereas passive tissues can be most cases months. So if you pre-fatigue yourself a little bit optimally in the beginning before your core lift, you're forcing the body not to go as hard on the main lift, therefore less motor unit breakdown in the compound movement, but you're still isolating volume in the weaknesses. See? And then if you look at like about 2018, there's a guy named Visniak um, that shows that passive tissues adapt slower. They show nerve, muscle, and bone. And this is just a relative statement. This is not specific, but it's close. And I would say I agree. Um, muscle, nerve, and bone adapt between 10 and 14 weeks to training. Okay? Ligaments, tendons, and cartilage, 70 to 90 weeks. Bro. <laughs> So now you're going to worry about getting stronger at this point. Why wouldn't you worry about making sure you're fucking bulletproof first? This is goes back to cars again. You don't want to take a Honda Accord and put a fucking Hemi in it with a goddamn nitrous bottle. The frame is going to snap. But if you build a real fat frame first and say, fuck the motor, I'm building big brakes in a big frame. Now your horsepower limitation is not limited at all. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 horsepower. Does that make sense what I mean? Mm -hmm. But everybody's focused on the engine, the muscle, and they're not focused on the structure, the passive tissue. And so you have to make sure that your training, especially in the beginner and intermediate levels, is one, trying to attempt, at least attempt, to correct weaknesses and focus on GPP. And three, have your emphasis on your frame and your brakes, which is your ligaments, your tendons, and your passive tissue. Big ask, right? Yep. Because a beginner is going to want to push. Yeah. Exactly. Because their main drive initially is I want bigger muscles and I want to be stronger, but they don't ask the question is what's going to allow me that? What does, what allows me that process? And the key is what is the muscles attached to and what causes things to move the joints. So if I'm not focused on cartilage, ligaments, or tendons, I can almost guarantee you if you stay in it long enough or you're dumb enough to push hard enough too fast, those will be the limiting factors, not your muscle. Yeah. So the injuries. So do you want to do it beforehand or do you want to do it afterhand? Because the afterhand problem is now you're going to work around injuries and you're going to be limited in what you can do versus if you started off right in the first place, you would have better technical proficiency and your lifts would go consistently in a more linear fashion on the way up because you're not fighting these problems. Yes. In a story. Yeah. No, I get, I get, I get it. You know, I'm just, I'm looking at it from a critic side yeah, yeah, you know, I get it. of all that, of, um, yeah. you know, cause we've seen this, you know, for years and years and years. And I, I'm going to look at things from a biased perspective, yep. you know, but try to see things from that other perspective sure. as and well. There's another perspective I think we can throw into this as well. In 1985, Medvedev in one of his books talks about for youth athletes. So we're talking below 13 years old. So I'm imagining that people are asking these questions are above 13 years old. Mm -hmm. At 13 years old, Medvedev's system incorporated 23 different movements for two Olympic lifts. 23. So not just squat bench deadlifts. I'm not just going to focus on those areas. So they're trying to get these guys better at clean and jerk and snatch. And they're using 23 different movements to make those two lifts succeed. Why would that be? Because... The 23 lifts, the other special exercises they're using are probably bringing about the weaknesses, correcting the motor patterns before the compound movement becomes too strong to go backwards. Yes. Right? Yes. So do you want to go forward consistently slower or do you want to go forward fast and then have to take back steps because you fucking skipped shit? You know, think about like development of a child, right? And I'm, <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, I'm writing manuals for this now. We don't teach children mathematics by starting with algebra. We start with basic math, which is isolated movements, technical proficiency, one plus one. Then you move into the algebraic scenarios once that has created a comp, a very complex base. Now we rise up. So we teach the education system almost, I wouldn't say conjugate, but we teach it simplistic to complex. 
training should be similar. You should be focusing on weaknesses structurally, then work on compound movements to improve. And now you're in a way better scenario. But think about that. I mean, 85, they're using 23 exercises with youth groups to create two lifts. And we're pissed that Matt uses 35 exercises for three lifts. Yeah. Bro. Come on. See what I mean? Yes. Where when you look at most, most of the top lifters, they all train differently once they get to a certain point. Mm -hmm. You know, so one of my <clears throat> things I've tried to do through the podcast is find all the similarities, yeah. you know, that are across all these different modalities. But the younger lifters are going to look towards the the top lifters, and there's a high percentage of those that just squat, bench, and deadlift. There's no accessory movements sure. whatsoever, which brings that next criticism back towards well, conjugate. And that criticism, yeah, I, I look at it in this perspective, and it's not, it's case by case basis, but yeah. I would say on average, and please agree or disagree, the person that uses specificity most times has the shorter career. So again, I'm a very big proponent and not because I lasted, but Ricky Dale Crane, five world championships and 10 national titles. Larry Pacifico, 10 world titles unbeaten. Eddie Cohen, multiple world records, 10, you know, at least 10 world titles um, and lasted until his late 30s. You start seeing a lot of these guys, um, longevity is a crucial factor. So what I've seen with this new simplistic, what I would consider a simplistic style of training is I've seen fucking bottle rockets. Pew, boom, gone. Pew, boom, gone. The average age when you and I were at Louie's place, you guys were all in your mid-late 30s. Mm -hmm. Not, you weren't 21. You weren't 22. And then now you see these people, I don't even need to name them. They're retiring at 26. Motherfucker. I wasn't even really good until I was 28, and I didn't really hit my prime until I was 35. But nobody had patience. That's what I see. And, you know, the thing of it is, like I said, you know, simplistic systems, when you become more educated in how the human body works, for instance, you know, just finishing that doctorate, it doesn't open your eyes to make you more educated. It makes you realize how fucking dumb you really are. Because... When I finished my master's in biomechanics, you know, and I even had this, you know, and I, I get flack for it all the time, this presence of like, I fucking, I come off as like, I know everything. Because when you get a master's, you master one area. When you get a doctorate, you plug that one area into 500 other areas and realize you do not have the time or the, the mental capacity to absorb the 500 different variations of what is actually going on. So I want to understand how a person realizes that a simplistic training program that's not revolving around ligaments and tendons, doesn't really understand anything about the CNS, doesn't understand about the, the delayed timing of how things adapt to training. You tell me how a simplistic system actually doesn't have a massive amount of Swiss cheese holes. Mm -hmm. It has to, because I felt like I knew more six or seven years ago than I do now because I've been introduced to more areas of understanding that, holy shit, you know? And I remember I was able to talk with Zasiorski on the phone about three to five times in my undergrad because Dr. Kramer was his prof was a professor at Penn State while Zasiorski was still working there. And he goes, look, I'll give you this guy's number and you talk to him, but don't waste his fucking time. I mean, this dude was in charge of all of Soviet system training. And I look back now and I'm embarrassed for the questions that I asked because I would not ask the same questions now. And I remember him saying, he's like, you are going to go down a path where you're going to think you know a lot of shit. And then he's, he didn't use those exact words, but he's like, and then you're going to realize at a certain point, as you keep reading and you keep trying to understand, you don't know shit. I mean, really is what he said. And I'm thinking, God, what a dick, you know? But now I'm at this stage, he was right. It's like, there's so many neurological factors, hormonal factors, skeletal factors, muscular factors, endocrinology factors, like hormonal, you mm -hmm. know, um, developmental factors, age, chronological, training. I mean, we could keep going on and on. How the fuck do you know all those? How can you possibly know all those and then send me a simplistic training protocol with none of that addressed? 
it blows my fucking mind. <laughs> so again, it's, it's difficult because, you know, people ask me, hey, Matt, well, I'm having an issue with this or that. I don't see the whole picture. I need to see what you're doing on your workouts. I need to see how you're sleeping. I need to see how you're eating. I need to see your stress levels. I need to see what equipment you have available. Well, holy shit, man. Like, it's not as a simple of a question as most people think it is. It's a complex question because you're dealing with a complex organism. I mean, we've talked about this yeah. before with the military. Like, I sit down with a pretty high-level general, and uh, he's like, you know, I— I like what you're doing, but I don't understand why we have to teach these guys how to work out for a whole week. It's just working out. And I point out there's a tank sitting over in the in the yard. And I said, hey, what about that tank? Is that hard to drive? You know, talking to him like I'm a dumbass, like he's talking to me about weight mm -hmm. training. Oh, yeah, that's a really complex machine. That takes, you know, about a year to learn how to go through all the controls and all the gauges. I said, does that have an endocrine system? What's that? Hormones, like does your body over or under train? Do you have like, you know, how is this working? How's that working through chemical reactions? Well, not really. It's all electrical. Okay. What about, um, does it have things that can adjust to, to stress? So it gets shot in the side and it repairs itself and fix itself. No, we have to manually do that. So you're telling me that you want me to take a body that has all these factors of development and teach them how all this works in like a day. You're telling me it takes a year to learn how to drive a tank, and it's just a p fucking piece of machinery. Has none of these other factors, none of these self-regulating factors, self-healing factors, overtraining. The tank just either works or breaks, right? It's basically on-off versus the body is a ton of gray area with a lot of weird scenarios involved. And not that I was teaching them everything, but... It, again, it was showing them the complexity. And he's like, man, I didn't even realize like how much was involved with that. I was like, I know you don't because I'm still learning. And this was like when I was like 30, thought I knew everything. And I was like, I'm still reading and learning shit. And so again, simplistic programs, I think seem ideal for people because they don't want to, they don't want to take the time and effort and energy to learn how to actually do it right. But for me, it was always about, I didn't want to waste my time either. Like why do something and not try to do it at least as close to right as you can? And then if a lot of people don't want to do it right because they're because of their ego or they're scared that they somebody's going to show them what they don't want to hear, which goes back to our education system. Hey, Timmy, I know you suck at math, so let's just focus on art and then we'll just get you through math. We're not going to try to make you better at your weaknesses. Hide those. Hide the weaknesses. And if you look at our system and the way it's set up is we're pushed towards our strengths versus understanding and trying to develop our shortcomings, right? I mean, think about how we're taught. Like, I'll give you a personal example. 1998, I graduate high school, um, and I don't graduate with a high GPA. Like, it's, it's not even high enough to get into college. And without going into all that story, I end up getting into college. Um, but what I found was is that my teachers were pushing me into vocational school, and some of it was my fault. Because I'm talking welding and metals, and yeah. that's what my uncle was good at, and my family knew how to do. And I knew that there were weight, there was weight trading, but I didn't know there was like high paying jobs. I mean, you know, if I was a welder at the pipe fitters union, I was making mm -hmm. that time 30, 40 bucks an hour. I'm thinking, fuck, I can live on that, you know? The only thing I saw in my local little homeschool town was like, you know, hometown was like, I could be a trainer make 10 bucks an hour, you know, I'm going to be basically a shit bag. You know yeah. I mean? And there's no old, older trainers either. So no. you, where's the longevity? No. And I didn't realize that until I moved to Columbus that it could be a possible scenario. So now I'm looking at, keeping in mind, I'm a dumbass high school kid with no internet. I don't even realize that pro football teams have strength coaches. I don't even know. All I know is in high school, we had our football coach was our strength coach and he was fucking horrible. <laughs> And only thing he would do for me was I started getting stronger because I'm training with guys on the other side of the town, Timmy Smith and Jim Dawson. Timmy is a 500 pound bencher at 181. And Dawson is one of the first guys in the Midwest in like 69 to delft over 700. So these guys were like legends, right? And they're like, hey, we're going to teach you slow. You know, it's probably going to feel monotonous for a while, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't know everything. But my point being is the first thing that that Mr. Hancock could say as soon as I started getting stronger is, ah, Matt's on fucking steroids. He's telling the whole fucking class that because I'm mentioning like 300 as a freshman, 380 as a sophomore, four mid fours as a junior. And then when I came to see you at 18, I was mentioning 500. 
so I'm like a fucking freak, right? But I'm a freak in his eyes because yeah. mm -hmm. I go use steroids with these other guys. Yes. Right? Not because I'm trying to learn and I'm around people that are better than him. Period in the story, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what you find at that level is that, you know, people aren't being... I don't understand like gym coaches and football coaches that literally won't sit down and read a book. It almost blows my mind. It's like, if you're going to help somebody with something, why wouldn't you get smarter? You know, so it, that's interesting, but... Well, if you're, if you're looking at that, the, the weaknesses are going to far exceed the strengths, mm -hmm. right? So at some point, there has to be focus on the strengths, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you never would have broke a world record, sure, right? Because if you're looking at the system in, as a whole, well, you, know, you would have been studying all these other things, mm -hmm. you know, instead of learning yeah. to focus at a certain point. Well, and that goes back to where I was at. Linear periodization got me to about that 500 bench. Shoulders were killing me. Elbows were pissed. Wrists were fucked up. Neck wasn't feeling too good. You know, I mean, I start, I was 19. I'm already having like wear issues. Yeah. Because my old coaches thought linear periodization, you know, we're going to do 10s for a couple of weeks and eights and then sixes. We never really touch singles. So you're never really doing max effort work. You're basing everything on repetition method and nobody ever fucking heard of bar speed. Yes. So we're not doing any speed work. So it's just... Same nail, same fucking hammer, same piece of wood every fucking time. And it did get me up to a certain point with a shitload of mileage. Yes. Now, for the average person at that point, eh, I'm good. I'm hurting. I That's quit. still four or five years, right? Oh, uh, seven. Seven years I started of training, at 12 and a right? half. Right? So it's, that's what I think people kind of miss in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a lot of us kind of went through that same route. Yeah. That there was five to seven years mm -hmm. of this linear stuff that with most of the people I trained with at the time, they just stopped after they hit their yep. what do you ever, whatever false ceiling you want to call that. Because yep. in college, I was told you hit your genetic ceiling and now it's just trying to optimize just, everything. Yeah. Yep. And so you start to believe that bullshit because mm -hmm. of that. But the passion for the sport outweighed their, their thoughts. Yep. So you had to look for something different. Yeah. And you know, the thing of it is, is like most people would get to that strength level and they would be like, well, that's the end. I'm done. Yes. Because, I mean, most people asking that question are not near that strong. Yes. And they're thinking, well, I could do that. Well, here's what's crazy is at the gym the last 15 years, I've gotten people to my technical proficiency in an eighth of the time, utilizing a system that doesn't specify the squats as a normal person would say. Like, they're not always barbell squatting. They're not always free squatting. They're using boxes. They're using chains. They're using bands. They're fucking beginners under a skilled eye, and their technique is getting better than if they squat with a straight bar all the time, faster than I did. Um, but so why would that be? Because the other criticism is going to be the overuse of specialty bars and not having the specificity. Because they're concentrating in both the warm up and the accessories on their limiting factors, which are their structural weaknesses and the control of the muscle tissue that they didn't have control of before. Right. So I'm giving them the basic math before I give them the compound movement, the algebra, and now the algebra's cake mm -hmm. versus I'm going to start teaching you to squat by squatting. And now it's going to take me months, if not a couple of years before you get it down. When it's heavy, you can still focus versus maybe I should have fixed all those basic math problems or muscle imbalances, then taught you how to squat, which is why I'm avid of the belt squat, because it forces you to fix the lower before you tie in the upper on a squat, right? Now I'm just focused around something around my hips. I'm not scared because like on my machine, I have a, a bump stop where you're not going to get pinned in the machine. Mm -hmm. You can set it wherever you're comfortable and come down. And like I said, I don't care if somebody has it or not, but my point being is there's reasons why that there are what is what it is. Almost every client that I've brought in and taught how to squat the first, say, four to six months with a belt squat, I put a bar on their back. It's It looks like I've been teaching them how to squat for years. Versus like, and now they have no spinal compression mileage. They don't have any of the shear forces on their back. And they're getting similar motor activation as they would on a normal squat, which has been proven in studies by the University of Maine. And, and that, may, that may be the case for multiple different belt squats. But my point being is teach people segments, then add the whole, you know, and then your technique gets better way faster. Your mileage is way lower. And your fun to train is way higher. So if we look at like Detchler or whatever his name is in 88 that, that wrote the Olympic weightlifting book said that 75% of the elite lifters that he talked to, and this is elite, 
said that the reason that they ended up stopping competing at that level was because they were mentally burned the fuck out. So if you're using a rotating system with multiple stimuli, for most people, the variation is going to allow them a longer career based on psychological burnout. Because you can have all of the muscle development and all these areas fixed. As soon as you don't like to do this anymore, you're going to fucking stop. Yes. But that also, that still is going to happen. Sure. You know, even if it's conjugate, because at a certain point in time, things don't progress the sure. way we want them to progress. So the problem is, is like, if you look at it, I think it's just, it's a longer period. Like you're going to have less of that happen percentage wise over the course of say a hundred people. If it's a constantly variable system where the body's like, oh, it's a new stimulus. Oh, cool. You know, it's like I'm learning something new. It's like, to be honest with you, I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking tired of studying conjugate yeah. and this, all this shit, because it's the same damn thing I've been studying for years. It took me that long to get good at it. But the problem is, is that now I want to see how it applies to other areas. Right. So I need variety of how do you apply this new knowledge to these multiple areas? Because I'm fucking sick and powerful thing. Yeah, well, that's where it gets, it can become complex too, because the track and field example that we talked about is a little bit easier to kind of train. Mm -hmm. But if we were to use, you know, college football player. Yeah. And now you're dealing with limited time periods mm -hmm. and, and changing cycle or changing durations, you're going to have full access to sure. that athlete because of in season, off season, you know, X, Y, and Z. Right. So how do you go by that aspect. I guess it will special forces be the same because you don't know when they're going to deploy or how long they're going to deploy. Yeah. Which also right? I think gives an advantage to conjugate system because you're not, you're not ignoring too many rep ranges for too long. Like you have a sector of your training that you're focusing on endurance and GPP and hypertrophy. You have a sector of your training that's focusing on ligaments and tendons and passive tissue. You have a segment of your training that's focusing on maximal effort contractions, and dynamic effort contractions. So if you're not ignoring any particular scheme of training, Where's the limiting factor yeah. versus in a traditional system, you're going to trade off one for the other. Yes. Yeah, so they're going to be blocked. So out. again, if you're having a competitive type sport or special ops where really the timing of things is off, I think you're better on a concurrent conjugate system because you don't really need to peak that. It's always kind of stimulated on a consistent basis. So you're pretty good at everything all the time. Because mm -hmm. like I said, you know, if you're not trying to create power lifters, you don't really need peaking phases, but you better be sure that you're not ignoring speed work for too long or max work for too long or repetition work for too long. In traditional training schemes, you're going to work on something while you avoid something else. And then that depletes itself. And a lot of times, if it's neurological training, it's going to deplete itself way faster than maximal strength. So I know that there were some things on there like, you know, Matt only focuses with like maximal strength when a lot of these things, because maximal strength lasts the longest. So if somebody's stronger, they don't break as easy, right? And then the gains from that, if they have to take breaks or they got to go focus on cardio for a while, that maximal strength sustains itself if it's been trained for long blocks of time versus we have to stay on dynamic effort method and we have to stay on some form of explosive movements in order for those type 2 X fibers to not degradate or become uncoordinated. Well, that that, that actually proves and, dis, and is seen itself in just a basic linear program because as they peak, when's the last heavy squat? Yeah, 12 weeks ago is the last time they did a heavy single. Yes. So it's, if, if their last heavy squat is, say, three weeks out and then it's displayed at its maximum to meet four weeks out, then obviously, mm -hmm. you know, it maintained its ability. But what also happens at the meet, they're not going to be as conditioned because all the other stuff gets pulled out as well. Yep. So you're seeing the degradation of each one of those motor yep. abilities mm -hmm. throughout that time period where yep. the smart person doing the linear is going to yep. be able to keep in the conditioning because it's going to drop faster. Yep. So when you, once you're in fives, you're basically in neurological training. Threes, fours, twos, ones, you, you go down the list. Now you're almost primarily CNS. So for a lot of people that are listening, if you're female or if you're in a weight class that you can't rise up, right? Maximal effort work should be one of your best friends because it creates hardly, hardly any hypertrophy. But the problem is we've been taught that going heavy builds muscle. When in reality, going heavy builds CNS and going high volume builds muscle. So the lady that walks in goes, oh, I'm going to do my lunges for sets of 10. They're like, they think that they're not going to put on too much bulk when in reality, they're actually bulking 
their training is bulking. And then their one RMs that they're avoiding are actually their friend because their central nervous systems get better. And really the only muscles that get hypertrophy are the type two X or those hybrid level higher um, threshold fibers. Well, their, their fear would be that they're going to get hurt. Right. And then that's the other problem is getting hurt. And do you get hurt by going heavy one time or do you get hurt when your technique breaks down at rep six on a 10 rep set? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so there's a trade off, you know, because most of the time people, when they go heavy, they're going heavy, their central nervous system or their uh, shit, I don't know what you want to call it. Their anxiety is going to stop that lift before anything happens bad, unless they're skilled. Because we have learned yeah. to turn that off. Yeah. I think that for the average person, they're probably more detrimental to do higher reps under fatigue than they would be going heavy for lighter reps or lighter, yes. uh, lighter amount of volume. So like ones or twos, threes. You're probably less likely to get hurt down there than you are higher because most people's techniques going to break. Um, for an example, like you know, we have you had me out when I attempted that Tom Platts record, and then I remember that uh, Hooper tried it six months later, and what did his form look like at set 50, at rep fifteen? Fucking garbage. Mine looked all the same, and I'm not patting myself yeah. on the back, but there's only a limited amount of people that under that much tiredness and that much fatigue can maintain that much technique. And even the world's strongest man can't do that. You know what I mean? Now, now I'm a powerlifter and all I do is squat. So I should be more proficient at it than yeah. him. But the point being is like his technical capacity should have stopped around 15, but he was just strong enough to push through that, which increased his injury rates. So he'd have been better off doing a heavy single for talking injuries. Yeah, I've always found for myself, I was <clears throat> very, very rarely did I ever get hurt on a single and so, unless something just went mm -hmm. really fucking far sideways. Yep. Usually a bench or taking me somewhere in a yep. direction I don't want to go. <clears throat> but what scared the shit out of me would be, hey, let's see how many times we can bench 315. Mm -hmm. And then you're and it's like, <laughs> oh, fuck, you know. Then you start off the first five or six with perfect form and then all of a sudden that right shoulder gets tired, elbow kicks, wrist yeah. roll, Shoulder gets Pop. pissed. What pec starts to get mad because yeah. now you probably in the first five reps or eight reps or whatever your strength level is, you were using the right muscles. Once those say, "Hey, I'm out," then the other ones are like, "Hey, I can help." And then like, you better not fucking do that. Oh, it's it's, it's right? a different way. It's a different. It's easier to focus yep. throughout that whole heavy single on everything that needs to be tight mm -hmm. and activated. Exactly. You know, you start not being able to breathe. Yeah. You know, and all this other stuff, it's, it's harder to focus for those higher repetition, sure. heavy type sets. And that's where all my injuries would come, would be from stupid shit, you know, that really didn't have just ego, which is fucked up, right? Because you would think that the ego lifting is more the singles. But it's not. Where the ego lifting was more the fuck you. You did it for 19, I'm going to do it for 20. Uh -huh. And then you walk away and I'm fucked up. I think because gauge and powerlifting, what you start finding is that for us, is that one rep max is are those once in a while gifts that we are allowed to give ourselves through rigorous training. We don't look at 315 till failure as something that is earned. It's just done because it's just training. And then you get mentally sloppy mm -hmm. and you start not focusing as much, which comes back to instinctive protocol, which the warm up and the proper accessory selection should help that not happen as fast. Yes. Again, I do winning warm ups. I do what I feel is proper accessories, you can go back and watch that 520 for 24, show me where the form breaks. It doesn't. No matter how hard I strain, and I'm at complete failure at 24, and there's nothing wrong with my form. It would have passed at any power through me. For the Olympic lifters, yeah, it's two inches high. It's below parallel though. Mm -hmm. You know, but the point being is like, it's, it's one of those things, my back doesn't break, my knees don't come forward, I don't round, my hips aren't doing anything weird. My chest is staying up. It's just ba boom, ba boom. It's like a fucking Terminator. Yeah, you know, and that takes a long time to do. But I think that reinforcing those mo movement patterns are crucial, and it shows the level of work capacity. I mean, how many guys you saw within the last five years try it and either go to the fucking hospital and rhabdo because they're not fit enough to do it? They just think they're strong enough, or their technique breaks down so bad they can't finish any reps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen at least five. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe three. So it, it's it's one of those things where it was kind of like, you know, it was it was definitely an eye opening moment that what I was doing, I felt was working really well. So what would be the change of topic a little bit? Some of your favorite lifters, past and present, and then why? 
Oh, you know, Don Reinhold, it just always comes to my mind. Like the dude was a trendsetter way beyond his time. You have a super heavyweight raw record for at what, 30 years. I know I'm just being guesstimating, but it's close to that. Um, and just, just raw fucking badass, you know what I mean? And then goes and wins the world's strongest man. The only other guy I know to do that is Kaz. And if you look at Kaz's list and me and Kaz are friends, so we'll see him at Swiss here in a little bit. He didn't have Reinhold's technique, in my opinion. Like he was a, he was a fucking way bigger of a grinder, but Reinhold made everything look effortless, you know? So it effortless world record total that held for 30 years. Do you think that total may have been broken though? If uh, single ply and multi ply wasn't in the game because good question you know because there were nobody was doing it yeah i don't know i mean i i honestly i don't know because being a three lift guy myself realizing you know a 900 squat with no sleeves and then a fucking 600 bench which i've done and i know how hard it is and then pull 900 i don't know dude well, those mean, are even big, huge numbers. And especially have. at six foot, he was six foot four. It's not like he was Eddie Cohen, like short and built for it. That motherfucker was kind of not built for it at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really look at the whole spectrum of things. So him not being built for it, him making things look effortless and his record holding that long. To me, it's like, holy shit. Larry, and we're talking past now. Larry yeah. Pacifico, you just can't argue 10 world titles back to back untouched. Like, unbelievable. Ed Cohen, obviously, and I put him in like the middle. I wouldn't say he's old school. I mean, for me, but, um, you know, his technical veracity, his uh, his perfect build for the sport, other than his hip sockets being garbage. Mm -hmm. um, Kazmaier for his intensity. I mean, you never saw somebody have that much. I mean, like, he looked like he could literally take on a freight train when he was ready to do something heavy. I mean, and you watch it. I mean, you could see more of it because it was taped more World's Strongest Man. But from the people that I talked to that were still around. All right, guys, I'm here to lead FTS. I'm at the compound. Nobody is watching right now. So bear with me. I found some bands that I need really, really bad. Um, I'm going to throw them in my bag and take them home with me. So don't tell anybody. Bands are absolutely great. If you're looking for the safest way to train to become fast, to become explosive, become strong, safety, 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 safety. Watch some videos about using bands. Why should you buy the Elite FTS bands? I swear, promise, promise you guys, these bands will last longer than any other bands you will buy anywhere. They're a little more expensive. They're gonna last a heck of a lot longer. EliteFTS.com, get your bands just like I am. See ya. Back in that day, like I know Jim Dawson went and saw him when the Worlds was within reason, I think in York PA or something, he said, dude, he was, you couldn't talk to him. He was literally fucking psychotic, you know, but he, anything, when it was time to lift, it was game over. And so that kind of stuff really, really just blows my mind. You know, Ricky Dale Crane, RIP. I mean, you look at five world titles and then 10 national titles, you know, and being on national teams for years. I think Ricky Dale Crane was kind of at the end of his career when Eddie Cohen was coming through, if I remember my my time correctly. You know, you look at guys like uh, uh, Jim Williams, benching 675 in like the 70s. Nobody was even close to that. And you're just like, what in the fuck? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Another guy that comes to mind that didn't have good equipment and probably had to train pretty damn stupid, uh, Greg Lowe. Remember, he was locked mm -hmm. up for prison in PA for life for killing somebody at like 18. I don't even know if it was accidental. And they would let him out to go to like the USPA meets. He was totaling like 2,100 with prison with prison weights, mm -hmm. showing up at a meet and just fucking killing people. I remember Greg, Greg they call him the Beatle. Crazy, right? David Ricks. He just squatted like a fucking master's world record. He squatted like 650 at 65 years old. Yeah. Like, bro, come on. I mean- you know, so those guys to me past wise are just like, and I'm, and I'm missing a lot, but like off the top of my head, those guys were just fucking awesome. New guys. It's hard because I'm not in the sport. I don't see it as much. Um, you know, I've never seen hack do anything. I didn't, wasn't impressed with, um, uh, you know, he's a fucking animal. You look at guys like, uh, Shit, you can help me with names better than I could now, but I, I, I have to think about it. I'm, I, I'm more enamored with the old school guys because mm -hmm. that's what I grew up seeing in the magazines. And those were my guys I was pushing to beat. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at that new guy, that new Jesus guy that just squatted an IPF record, like a thousand fifty in just sleeves. Like to me, that's just 
I can't even imagine. No, you know? it's ridiculous. Because I've had that weight on my back with gear on, and I know what that feels like. So it's that's impressive to me. Um, I would say, you know, Maddox is just unfucking godly. You know, like I mean, you watch to see him in person. Like you know, I've watched him break a couple records, and I have never seen somebody fucking manhandle over seven fifty nearly in any lift like he does. Um, and so watching his explosive power, like his speed off the chest blows Mendelssohn, Kazmaier, kills him dudes. And obviously he's a monstrous guy, but like to be that fast and that big and that strong, like it just, it blows my fucking mind. You know what I mean? Um, another good friend of mine, Midwest Kong, like benching 80 reps with 225. <laughs> like, bro, I mean, I thought I was a badass at like 63 and I mean, obviously I was a full meat lifter, but dude, he's, and he's a black belt in jujitsu too. So it's not like he's just a bencher. I mean, this dude's like, you know, he's, mm. he's well-rounded. Um, ah, shit. I don't, you know, I don't know. I was always enamorated by Dorian because I just felt like he was quiet and just methodical and just trained it highly intensive. Right. And he's kind of more in the middle class. I wouldn't say he's old school per se, but he's, he's kind of in the middle. Um, yeah, you look at Jen Thompson. I mean, she, we don't have similar training ideals, but her being able to bench 300 at those body weights is, to me, is unbelievable. And for how long? Yeah, and, and having no shoulder pains and going completely against the grain of what I ever say. Jeremy Hornster is another guy that I say really blew my mind watching him benching in the mid sixes, high sixes at like 242 raw, which was just crazy. Um, the one, the one Russian guy that w was always at the raw unity meets when I was lifting heavy. Um, he had the knee wrap world record for a long time. I can't remember. Uh, Mark Bell used to have him. Hmm. You know who I'm talking about? Big guy. Yeah, real real yeah, good. Yeah. All three lifters. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know who you're talking about, but um, it's not coming to me. Newer hmm. guy too, Eric Lillibridge. Like, bro, that guy, I competed against him and I watched him and I realized it was time for me to check the fuck out. <laughs> it's like he was as explosive or more than me he was stronger than me and he was three and a half inches shorter than me and i knew like it was just a matter of time before he stepped up from 75 to 308 that i was not going to have that record mm -hmm. anymore um so that that was he was he's awesome as well i don't know if he still even competes anymore i heard he moved to australia but like probably five or eight years ago but yeah, I have no idea he's he's he was a beast you know what i mean but uh shit i'm trying to think Brandon, Brandon Allen was another mm -hmm. guy that just really blew my mind, but just didn't have the longevity. But I think if he could have stayed around long enough, he would have been, he would have been a top guy ever at super heavy and not that he wasn't, but he, I think he only tapped his potential. I think he just burned it out too fast. Um, th those would be the guys yeah. right off the top of my head. I'd say, you know, uh, who would be people to follow on social media? <sighs> That's a good one. Um, obviously, you know, you and me, mm -hmm. but because I feel like we post quality content and we try to give out as much as we can. That's what I hate about this job. You know, I wish I wish I had another job where they'd already made a an ass load of money to retire off of. I would love to just hand this stuff out for free. But a lot of people don't realize, like, you know, I still have to pay my bills. And mm -hmm. So it's difficult for me to kind of measure that out because I'm like, you know, I'd like to give all this stuff out and help as many people as I can. So what I try to do is price everything accordingly. Like, Hey, you know, I mean, might be, is this important to you? But, um, I would say you and me, I would say Dr. Andrew Locke, the dude talks not at an extreme level where people can understand, but I've been on a couple of stages with him and uh, I watch what he talks about and he's dead fucking nuts. And he understands strength because he benched over 500 raw. He understands what it takes to keep your shoulders healthy to do that. Um, McGill is another one. Great. Dr. Kanakin does not get near, Ken Kanakin does not get near the reputation that he should have for not, not only how smart he is, but also how likable he is. You know, he was one of those guys that really stepped down and he didn't know he did this, but he really stepped down my ego asking me to come talk at Swiss because I felt like he knew he respected my knowledge. But he also wanted to put me on a panel with people that were my equal, not because he thought I could shine, because he thought I earned it. And he just doesn't have any, he doesn't have any ego to him at all, but he respects people that he feels like are masters in their field, which makes the Swiss symposium, which is, you know, why I got so upset last year that they were talking about not doing it anymore was because I feel like he has a really good grasp on bringing the top people 
minds in the world in for that. You know, I think Allie Gilbert is doing some neat shit with the hormone stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody else that has a decent presence that I would say, um, man, it's hard, like throwing a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many, like I could, I can just can't think of any right now. Stan efforting is always putting out amazing shit for absolutely free. I wish I was more in Stan's position where he was a big business guy beforehand, had a lot of money saved up and then feels like he can just hand shit yeah. out. I, I really, I really am jealous of that, like hundred percent because I feel like people can learn more from me, but because it's a paywall, there's a little bit mm -hmm. more of a static or like this antagonist type deal. And I don't mean to come off that way. It's just, you know, like I should, I got to pay for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. And no, I don't remember anybody. I don't remember putting out an OnlyFans thing to pay for my fucking doctorate. Yes. Which was not cheap. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's hard because, you know, you want to be able to do that. But I would say Ken would definitely be one of them that gives out a lot. Stu McGill, Allie Gilbert. Um, I mean, even in some ways, you know, I, I look at Michael Hearn and he's a goofball. You know, we've been friends for a long time, but if you really watch what he's trying to say, he actually knows his shit really well. And I, I respect anybody that's been able to hold themselves together for 35 years of training and really not have any injuries and just be that lean all the time. I think Athean X is another one. Jeff Cavalier. I wouldn't say that we agree on everything mm -hmm. with what we do in training, but he really has a good way of taking complex things like I could feel I do and bring them down to a level that's usable. And people seem to like listening to him. So I, and I like the way he talks too. Um, I also like um, RPS. Uh, Mike is retail, you know, there's a lot of things we don't agree on either. Like one thing I posted, made a video about me versus him because he was somehow he used my video for not using fast eccentrics. And then I'm like, well, maybe I'm a fucking idiot. Maybe fast eccentrics aren't good. And then I go read up on it and I'm like, no, fast eccentrics have been heavily correlated with type two X fiber hypertrophy. You know, should I be dropping speed work? And for hypertrophy purposes, questionable, mm -hmm. but for overall athletic development, you definitely need fast eccentrics in training. And I think throwing out blanket statements like you shouldn't ever use something can be really bad. I got a few exercises that are like that. And I only do that to protect people. But I think he might have been doing the same thing with fast eccentrics because people are not going to drop, you know, like say I, I did 315 for speed work, which was a little out of my range on Wednesday. And I was like letting the motherfucker go. Average person does that. They're going to blow their shoulders off. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, like application wise, he has some some merit on what he's saying. I just think using blanket statements, and I've been guilty of it before too, of being absoluting. Like there are reasons to use certain things at certain times, but the mileage or the injury prevalence of it may not be worth telling the general population it's a good thing. Yeah. I, I'm not a big fan of upright rows. I've seen multiple football guys fuck their shoulders up because they just get sloppy, tear up their shoulder. Not really a big fan of military presses, which I know people bust my balls, but go sit in an anatomy class with an orthopedic surgeon that's replaced 500 fucking shoulders and have them dissect a fucking shoulder in front of you and look at the joint positioning when you see it cut open and you're going to understand the same thing I understand, which is... Kazmaier, Cohen, a lot of the guys that used overhead pressing to get their bench super strong can't wash their fucking hair anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I benched a lot and my shoulders are fine and I can still get under a straight bar, which is a miracle, by the way, yeah. for being 45 as long as I've done it. But point being is I think a lot of that was avoiding the overhead pressing. And the first person to tell me that was Louie. He's like, don't do them. They're going to fuck your shoulder up. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. And I'm like, well, if he knows this for 40 or 50 years experience at that time. I was just really good at listening. Like I wanted to listen to the people that lasted because I didn't have the genetics to come out and be a world record holder immediately. I had to work really hard in a long time and outlast multiple generations. I consider a generation in lifting maybe three to five years and then it's yeah. a new generation. Yeah. Would you agree? I would say, yeah, five years for sure. Yeah. Five. I mean, it, actually, no, I would change my, I would say three to five because yeah. it's articulating faster mm -hmm. now than what it was before. And some of that is a greater number of people coming in. They may not be as passionate about it. So mm -hmm. there's probably more one meat lifters than there's ever been before. There's definitely a lot of one meat coaches. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's definitely that. You know, they're, exactly, exactly. That's a whole I, other. I missed 225. Let me online coach you. Yes. Well, if you're a girl that weighs 123, that's pretty awesome. But yeah. if you're a guy. Well, still, the experience isn't there no matter what <laughs> no. the gender, you know. No, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a whole other factor of the gender, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, so 
yeah, to me, I think that's probably a... What are some of the other topics that you have there that I may not have brought up? These aren't, these are just kind of other yeah. notes that I had, um, and I can go through them a little bit. Yeah. Um, MEVDF states in 1986 that physical exercise should be ordered to give the best motor patterns. So again, that was another big reinforcement for the winning warm up, And these might be mm-hmm. not in order. Mm-hmm. So again, in 86, when I'm reading that, you know, I'm not reading it in 86, but when he publishes that and then I get a hold of it, it, it reinforces. Again, I read this in 99. Makes no sense to me. After doing winning warmups for 10 years, I read that. I'm like, fuck, should have been doing that all along, mm-hmm. though, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the next one is the winning warmups allow the aerobic system, both in blood pressure and pulse, to return to normal uh, normal rates from, from more rapid rates. So if you're out of shape, basically, being really good in shape means that everything comes back down to baseline way quicker, which can shorten your rest periods, allowing you more dense training in shorter periods of time, reducing overtraining. And that was Michael Yesis in 1994, right? Mm-hmm. So now that's like another like ding dong, you know? So that kind of got, that kind of got it. And then um, in 1989, N.I. Luchkin, which, you know, he's a big time Russian dude, warm up should include different loading variants. So that means your warmups can't look the same all the time or your body will adapt to them, law of accommodation, right? Then 86, Medvedev states again, it's necessary to devote training time to the ligaments and tendons with higher volume and lower intensity. Another light bulb. Yeah. So when you're talking about the loading variants, how would that cycle? So what you would do is say, let's just use triceps, for example. We're going to do push downs, and we know we got to do push downs probably at least every, close to every workout for upper body for the bench press. Rope, fat bar, reverse grip, hammer grip. Um, you could do cable, band, JM press lightly, skull crushers, like, you know, Louis' mm-hmm. favorite rollbacks, your tape fold yeah. ins, right? Tape presses, like all of those are yeah. variables. They're still triceps though, mm-hmm. right? So you're still hitting the main area that's probably the problem, but you're doing it in a varied way. Got it. So the loading variance based upon the movement. Yeah, movement. Same. I I, I look at same muscle, different stimulus. Yes. Okay. And I know people get pissed. Like we, you know, Matt only thinks that you know lats and triceps should be, because I've been around it for thirty years, and that's where everybody's fucking weaknesses are. At least ninety percent. So if you're asking me a general question and I don't train you, I'm going to go with ninety percent. Oh yeah, I would agree with that a hundred percent. Are you agreeing with that? A hundred percent. The only other one that is we use, but I wouldn't say, I, and I probably neglect when I talk or when I write, rotator cuff is another yeah. fucking monster because you don't realize how important rotator cuffs are until you fucking fuck one up. Yes. What caused Eric Spoto to bow away from powerlifting, tore both rotator cuffs off? Yes. Lower body, I'd say hamstrings. Lower body, I'd say hamstrings or and or glute activation. Mm-hmm. It's never quads. And that's why I always have this huge issue a little bit with like knees over toes is because you're attacking people's strengths. I'm not saying they're strong doing what he's saying. What I'm saying is neurologically, the body doesn't have a problem turning on the quadricep. It has a big problem turning on glutes and hamstrings. A handful of reasons. One, due to our lifestyle. And two, when people do legs, for the most part, they're doing what they see in the mirror. But what they don't realize is that the mirror behind them is the one showing them all their fucking problems. Mm -hmm. And so if you're using a quad dominant style squatting pattern, how is that addressing the weaknesses? And again, we could have debate over that for hours. But point being is strong hamstrings have been correlated with less knee problems, correlated with better technical proficiency in both running and squatting and jumping. Well, the lats are behind, the triceps are behind, the glutes are behind, and the hamstrings are behind. Right. The next one would be lower back. Mm -hmm. Like most people's lower back are not strong enough to sustain what the legs can do. So we see this all the time. Somebody goes into a big squat, they get in the bottom, their back rounds, they can't lift it no matter how strong their legs are. So we know that isolating quadricep training probably is not going to advance our training much past beginners if we're not focusing on those areas behind us, right? Mm -hmm. So... um, so Yakolev, Korbiev, and Giannis in 1957 exercises limiting the fundamental work of the session and exercises that create fundamental motor patterns. So what you're what he's what they're saying is that the exercises you select before the main movement needs to be reinforcing proper technical proficiency. So if my hamstrings are weak and I do some hamstring curls before I squat, over time, not that day, but over time, it's going to start changing our motor patterns. Um, you have to create fundamental motor habits. 
creating basically the spark plug to the muscles that you want to turn on and you want to tell to work when you're doing compound movements, when larger, more motor unit corrected or dominant muscle groups are going to try to go, no, 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 I got it. I got it. Right. It's like the big guy in the moving, like I'll pick that shit up and move mm -hmm. it. You don't let the little guy do it. When if the little guy and the big guy work together, <laughs> it'd be a lot fucking easier. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. Um, this could go on for a while. <laughs> Um, contractile properties and temperatures have a, a huge effect. So Turner in 2018, another big light bulb moment, and I already knew this, and some people should know this too, but I think it's great to bring up, is that are you bringing the body up to a higher temperature just based on the fact that your contractile properties are going to increase with temperature increases? So if you're walking in and you're working up to something kind of cold, not only are you probably higher risk of injury, but you're also not going to contract nearly as hard. So if doing the warmups optimally will actually help with the contractile properties of the muscle tissue in themselves. Yes. Right. So that's an interesting one. Um, 82, um, Lipkin and Oshenko, um, So diversity of physical exercise is more important than volume. That's a fucking hard one to swallow there. Because if you just do more reps, you're supposed to get better, right? Yeah. They're saying that diversity of physical exercise is actually better. And then you start reading more into that and you start seeing that they're basically talking about law of accommodation. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a sky, there's a limit to the amount of volume that you're going to be able to withstand. But in diversity, there's a much bigger pool to choose from in the same time limit and energy level limit or the car, the reserve. Well, how, how broad can that diversity be? The, the diversity is based on the equipment that you have. Okay. That's one. Two, the education level you have. And three, do you know where your weaknesses are or are you just training what you like to train? Yeah. Like some people like training with the safety bar because they're not pinched in with their shoulders. Totally agreeable. But if you use the safety bar forever, eventually that straight bar is going to get off kilter. For me, probably you. I use the safety bar the closest to the competition as possible because my benching was insanely fucking hard. Mm -hmm. So I restored my shoulders while I was squatting my nuts off, allowing my bench to still stay in progression. There was a reason behind my variation. Yeah. There wasn't just because I like to use the safety bar. To be completely honest with you, I fucking hate the safety bar. It puts a lot of pressure on my neck. It causes my fingertips to go to sleep because my vertebrae is getting squashed. But every time my safety bar went up, my back squat went up and it was not equal. Meaning if my safety bar went up five or 10, my back squat with a straight bar went up 20 to 30 every time. I remember my max on the safety bar when I was at my strongest was right at 700 free weight. It's pretty, pretty damn good, right? Especially for a six foot one guy. That's when I squatted 870 with a straight bar. When I squatted 675, my squat was 832. And now I'm talking everything I have. Mm -hmm. There's not one, you, a fucking ant shits on the plate and ain't going, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so every time it went up, it was, it was a huge jump. It was almost twofold. So 10 pounds on the safety bar, 20 pounds on the straight bar. Because my limiting factor was my torso height. Not my femurs are pretty short, but my torso is fairly tall. And so if my upper back has to work harder with that safety bar to squat, I go with a straight bar. It's two and a half, three inches lower on my rear delt. I've just shortened the lever arm. Now I'm stronger. Mm -hmm. There's a reason behind the variation. So if we go into this talk here and, and I'm throwing out, again, I, I wish I could live a hundred lifetimes to experiment with this. Beginners should have around 20 something exercises that they rotate. Roughly. And I'm not talking, I'm talking in total squat, bench, deadlift. Yeah. So you're talking like six lifts each, mm -hmm. six variations. As you become intermediate, you probably need to bump that up to around 30 or 40. And as you become advanced, it becomes almost limitless. Yes. It could be anywhere from 75 to 100 is similar to the original conjugate system. And again, please understand your history because conjugate was not developed for powerlifting. It wasn't developed for gear lifting. It was developed for... Bonder Chuck's throwing and the Russians Olympic weightlifting is not, it was not, it, and if you look at the amount of years that they use that, which was around 73 to about 90, it actually had a longer progression and much more scientific basis for Olympic lifting than Louis ever could experiment with. One, because he didn't have 
doctors around him at all times creating data, right? And also not experimenting with 500 master of sports. We only had maybe what? I'd say world-class guys at Westside at one time, maybe eight to 10. Yeah. And that's being generous. Yeah. Right? Guys, you mm-hmm. can go break a world record, eight to 10 dudes in one gym, which is fucking awesome. Yeah. But it's not 500. No. That is a hell of a sample size. Right. And so I think what I think if I had to follow and what I've learned and what I've read, I'd say, you know, 20 as a beginner, 35 or so as an intermediate, 75 or so as an advanced. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you can't use newer exercises sooner, but it might mean you need ex, you need an experienced coach to tell you which of those exercises probably are being need to be used at that time. Because I'm saying exercises, I'm not giving you movements because as I just said, safety bar, if it went up 10, it went up 20 on the straight bar. That might be opposite for you. Yes. So we might need to use a spider bar or we might need to use more chains because you suck at the top or we might need to use box squats because you suck at reversal strength. What you suck at is going to depict about 60 to 70% of what your training cycle should look like. So if you suck in say these three areas, they should be plugged in half the time, minimum. Yes. But based upon those recommendations, what we typically see is the inverse. Mm -hmm. The beginners are using too many variations and then the advanced are not using enough variations, Mm -hmm. you know? So (laughs) that's where they're fucking up. Well, think about it. The only guy in the Olympic system that was allowed to do whatever he wanted with no coaching interference was Alexiev. And Mevdiev followed him and Alexiev said, you know, I'm going to take this Dynamo crew and I'm going to make them do whatever I do. And they all got better. And then Pachenko came along and he trained Pachenko. And then Pachenko became arguably one of the best Olympic lifters to ever live. And their variations were almost unmatched. If you look at Vor- or um, Abdiev, and I'm probably not saying that right, but from Bulgaria, you look at him, they only had like 10 exercises. That's all they used. They didn't use a very complex system and they had an amazing results. But it's funny when I had my friend go back, he, he grew up in the Bulgarian system when the Russians ran them. So he can speak Russian, he can read Russian and Bulgarian. So it's a fucking hell of a, hell of a superstar to have in my gym. Not because he's an amazing lifter. He can fucking read this shit. Mm-hmm. So when he goes back home to see people in Bulgaria, he brings me back Abedev's books and some of the Russian books that he can find. And then he can read them real quick and go, you need this chapter. You need this reference. You need this. And then translate them, which there's a bunch in the book when it, whenever the fuck it comes out. Yeah. Jesus. So, <laughs> um, but the long story short is Abedev did not believe in variation. So I'm not saying that there's not another way you can do it, but Abedev's system was meant, and he'd tell you straight out in those books, he's meant to find the freaks. He's not looking to develop anybody. You either have it or you don't. And they would take, Demeter saw this schooling in the, in the late, in the early eighties, late seventies. And he said they would take these guys in and they would beat them to a fucking pulp. And the guys that survived are their team guys. So it wasn't like the, the, the Russians had a completely different mindset in how to do this, even though they were all Eastern Bloc. The Bulgarians said the human will fit the program. And the Russians said the program will fit the human. Okay. That makes sense? Yes. So the adaptability, because the, and the reason that happens is because Bulgaria was a very tightness genetic community. They had a certain build, not very tall, lots of muscle, very good hip sockets, very good shoulder sockets, ideal for... Olympic weightlifting. That's why they were a big, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Then you look at the Russians, vast major, vast array of different types of builds. I mean, Alexiev was not really built to be an Olympic lifter. He's like six foot three. I mean, we all know that six foot three is probably not ideal. Yeah. And but Lasha is doing great, and he's like six foot five. Doesn't mean that they can't be outliers. But in the Bulgarian system, both Alexiev and it says it in some of these books, both Alex back then because it was a long time. Alexiev would have been turned away from the Bulgarian system. He's like, nope, you're too tall. Get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. We're not going to help you. We're not going to adjust the training for you. You don't fit the system. You don't compete. Where in the Russian system, like, hey, we might be able to make this guy a badass in like 10 years if we do it right. Yeah. Why wouldn't you follow that system? Yeah. So it goes back to linear periodization. If you're a fucking super freak and you're a, you know, a Larry Wheels or a fucking, you know, um, any of those guys you want to mention, if you want to find that dude, I think linear periodization in a very archaic system probably works really well. Unfortunately, the vast array of the population is not have those genetics 
And so utilizing a system that doesn't vary enough in order to make sure you're not getting beat up is a huge problem, which is why we see this two to three or four year return generational yeah. training because there's very few people that are both super strong and stupid smart. And you start seeing like, who was the last guy to have a world record? I mean, I'm, I'm going to take myself out of this, but who's the last guy to have a world record and fucking PhD? Fred Hatfield. 1979. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about compensatory acceleration, talking about getting faster to get stronger, almost in the, in the Western world, especially, but almost before the Russians. Like the Russians understood the dynamic method before then, but in a powerlifting sense, they didn't give a shit about powerlifting because if you want a powerlifting, it didn't mean that the Soviets were better than you. In the Olympics, it definitely did. Yeah, yeah. So that was their goal. But the point being is like, you had a dude in the late 70s talking about compensatory acceleration way before Louis. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you're just like, oh shit, this is, uh, this is uncharted territory. You know what I mean? So it, it's one of those things where now I put a lot of responsibility. You see the notes. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you shit that is actually referenced, you know, uh, it's just difficult because I think people, they find out like whatever they think works in the beginning. And then they don't realize that that has to change. And I think this is another th big thing to throw out. And this is just an overall view. I'm not saying this is exact, but if you're actually reading and you're actually experimenting and you're actually trying to learn how to train, your training should look different about 10% every year, not a hundred percent, 10. Mm -hmm. Like you and I have certain skeleton beliefs of what we know works. And I'm saying they're probably really similar. Yes. But there's 10% of that that might be varied based on our experiences and who we've been around for an extended period of time or what you or yeah. I have read. Yes. And so when that happens, then you have this development process, an evolutionary process. So my training doesn't look 100% different from 10 years ago, but it's probably a solid 35% different because I think that window starts to shut. But if we're talking beginner intermediate, I strongly believe your training should look 10% different every year. Yeah. So year one to year 10, your training probably should look 100% different if you're listening to your body and you're trying to keep learning new shit and get better. For sure. Would you agree? Oh, for sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Throw something into that on that one. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, well, with that, it's first off, they're not going to last that long. Right. Yeah. You know, so that makes you wonder right mm -hmm. there. Right. right. Because it isn't different. That's why the window is going to be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, assuming that they want to stay in. Like, yeah. Some people don't. Right. Yeah. But if they're going to have that long, if they expect to have any longevity to not, if they're not the genetic outlier that, and everybody, and nobody doesn't say this. If they're not the genetic outlier, it's going to take more years than what they think. Mm -hmm. Way more. Way more. So you know? again, I started 12 and a half. How old was I when I broke the first total record? 28. Yeah. So the two decades. 15 and yeah. a half years. Yes. And I remember, I've talked about this before. I squat my first 700. I just turned 20. Ed Cohen's at that meet because it's about an hour from where he lives. It's real close to Chicago. It's actually where they founded the USAPL. So for you fuckers, it was drug tested. Eddie Cohen's there and he comes up to me, he goes, dude, you're, you're going to be a really good squatter if you can last another 10 years. Mm -hmm. Again, well, I just squatted 720 years old. What the fuck are you telling me this? Like, I got to wait till I'm 30. And then I'm driving home and I'm thinking, eh, I want to be in this till I'm 30 anyway. I don't give a fuck. And then two years later, I squat my first 800. Yeah. Well, see, and, then, and then tough. Eddie's like, I wanted to tell you that because I wanted to see if you were worth me helping. Mm-hmm. Like, are you in this just because now you're good? And then as soon as it gets hard, you're going to stop? Or are you in this for the long haul? Well, that's why it has to change a certain percentage <laughs> each year, because it's going mm -hmm. to get hard. Hard. Really hard. Yeah. And 1%, to get 1% better is going to feel like 100% more work, both physically and mentally. Because you have to, and we've talked about this before, but outsmarting getting stronger is so much easier on your body than just roughing through it. You know, you can push that extra rep or you can, but if it's not optimal, it doesn't matter. If you're training smart, you're going to be in an optimal range more often. Therefore, your car, your anabolic reserve is going to be less taxed. Therefore, you're not going to get burned out nearly as fast, yeah. right? Well, the, the thing to point out with that, though, is that doesn't mean that neither you nor I wanted to squat 100 pounds more in the next meet. No. We did. The same way everybody <laughs> does now. Uh -huh. It's right. So it's not like we're sitting there saying, oh, we know this is going to take 10 years, so we're going to be really passive yeah. and really we're still conservative. Mad about it. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> it's just we're in the back of your mind, you're like, is this worth, you know, yeah. taking off? 
two years off what my prime could be. Uh -huh. And I made the wrong decision on that many times, which did take years <laughs> off what my prime could be. And so, you know, looking back, you know, it, it does take longer, but I hated hearing that the yeah. same way you hated hearing that and everybody else, but uh -huh. it's fundamentally true. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's just crazy. I think that you just have to, you have to be willing to be a student of the game and not put all of your coins or your emphasis on progression. Sometimes it's just outlasting. Yes. It's duration. It's being able to I was stuck at 500 and I know it. people are like, oh God, I was stuck at 500. What a fucking, you know, I would dream to bench that. I was stuck at 500 for two fucking years around all you assholes that were benching six. Mm -hmm. So tell me how that feels. That's like you benching 200 around guys that bench 300. And you're like, all I want to do is I want to be up there. I want Louie to tell me good job, which maybe happened once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Or I wanted George to tell me my triceps weren't fucking garbage mm -hmm. or whatever, you know? There was an idolization point, but I was willing to work hard enough to at least try to achieve that. Yes. And it didn't matter how long it took. And some of that probably was a, a mixture of OCD <laughs> and just being fucking insane, you know? But some of the worst, I mean, like, I, you know, and I also got some of the worst advice from that point. I mean, you know, I remember finishing, Louie was- so adamant about me not going to masters. He didn't not want me to get a masters. He was like, you just need to get your fucking ass over here and start training to be strong, fuck the school and blah, blah, blah. And I knew at that point that if I didn't, there was no way I was getting, because my dream thing was a pro job. And we talked about the yeah, Browns before, yeah. but yeah, I knew that I was going to be limited in my ability to get any kind of a good job at that point. If I didn't at least have something over a graduate or a, a, you know, just a regular graduate degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one thing I, Fortunately, I did not listen to, but I think in Louie's mind, you know, he, he didn't have a lot of, and I'm, I'm talking in generalities, but I don't think he had a lot of respect for like organized schooling. No, no. And I think you know? he also understood that even though it does take a long time, we are all still working within a certain window of our lives. Yeah. You know, so it, if he, he's like... You know, you've been at this for 12 years, you know, maybe there's 10 more, yeah. you know, you're five more into that. So there's five more, uh -huh. you know, why waste this five more years? Yeah. Yeah. Know, when because you're his, there. Yeah. His main goal was he wanted numbers on the board. Yeah. And once you understood that, and like you were trying to tell me for years, like, yeah, no, he's my buddy. I get it. Yeah. Once I understood that, it made all the sense in the world because in his mind, that board was going to be legendary and infamous forever. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite things about lifting was taking jail off the board, you know, because I felt like it was the next torch handover. Yeah. Like your generation was out. Ours was coming up. Yeah. But, you know, that created a lot of rift because I had to use a different technique that Louie didn't like. I had to go learn how to bench from Bill Crawford. Well, kind of in a way, he was trying to do what the Bulgarians were doing. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Just beat the fuck out of them. Yeah. And who lasts, the lasts and who doesn't, doesn't, right? <laughs> yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. You know, and it took... You had to be very strategic on how you would pivot your shit around. Yeah. That, yeah. And I didn't do it. Yeah. No. I did it like he did it, which is, hey, look what I saw. Let's try it. Not realizing that that was a- No, that there's was a, a process. bad problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a process. Well, especially at that age group, because I think, and we've talked about this before, but I think that when you guys were coming up in the, I'd say early mid nineties, he might've been a little bit more pliable in the, cause I remember like George Albert telling me, you know, he would experiment with shit and he'd be mad and George would be like, fuck you. I'm doing what I want to do. And mm -hmm. he would tolerate it. And then at our generation, he, I think he felt like, and he did a lot know what he was talking about. But as soon as somebody had a variation or a difference in that, and even if it was good or bad, it was kind of like he's working against the grain. Yeah. Well, with George, though, you got to remember, too, he was coming in before Louie would get in. Yeah. Yeah. So he was training earlier. Sure. So he, he was, was able avoiding. To, he, yeah. He was able to get away <laughs> yeah. with more of that to where we would have to strategically. Like yeah. if we had an idea, we couldn't necessarily tell him. We had to tell somebody outside the gym that would tell him uh -huh. and then it would come back. Yeah. You know, so it's, and then he wouldn't want to tell people outside the gym that what they're doing isn't what he's saying. Yeah. And now he's kind of forced to agree in certain respects. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other thing I had was Verkashansky in 03 talks about complex systems. Focusing on neural and structural weaknesses is crucial for proper training application. So basically meaning that if you can't just focus on muscle when you're training, you got to focus on the structural weaknesses neurologically. You got to focus on passive tissue, which we've already went over. I just think it's an interesting um, reference to have is kind of showing that don't be a one trick pony in your training cycles. 
don't just focus on one RM strength because when that happens, you're going to have a big problem, mm -hmm. right? You need a vast array of stimuli and you need a vast array of goals, which also comes back to burning out. If you have variety in your training and your goals are, okay, this off season, I want to put five more pounds of muscle on. It's not really a one RM emphasis. It doesn't mean you don't do max effort work. Mm -hmm. It just means it doesn't matter. I want to get faster on this accelerometer. I'm moving at 0.6 meters per second. I need to move at 0.7 meters per second in the next 12 weeks. Great goal, mm -hmm. right? Then you have a max effort goal. Rotating those goals while still maintaining some form of ability is the magic of the conjugate system. You're not really ignoring anything for too long, but you're changing emphasis enough that the body is constantly rotating stimulus, therefore following law of specificity and law of accommodation in an equal double-edged sword right in the middle. Yeah. Right. Instead of focusing on the one or the other, Just, there can be too much variety and there can be way too much specificity. And both of them have different outcomes of what happens. So if I have too much variety, I may not specifically see my squat go up. If I have too much variety, but it's not in my weaknesses, my lifting technical pr probably won't move. My technical ability will not get better. On the other end, if I train too specific, then my body is going to have basically burnout rates really, really high and overuse injuries in particular areas because I'm not changing the pressure gradient, right? Mm -hmm. That's what that tells me. Um, you had a question on program hopping. I mm -hmm. have a problem. And I'm just paraphrasing and, and probably not using the right words, but he was talking about, you know, I have a problem sticking with one program too long. And I think something that can help with that is if you read Verkashansky from 79, he said that when the Soviets would lay down training cycles, program blocks should be given a minimum of six months to focus on long-term progression and the actual abilities to get better. Not a week, not a workout, not a fucking month. Yeah. Six months minimum. And that is from 79. Like, so try to put yourself in a position where, okay, I'm going to give something six months. I mean, how many times have you had people email you go, hey, man, I tried that that workout that you posted and I did it for a week and I didn't get any better. What the yeah. fuck's wrong with this shit? It didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. Fuck. yeah. And I'm thinking like a week of time in your life is fucking like 0.0001%. Like you're going to give yourself enough time to adapt to anything? No. <clears throat> so I think the problem with that is, is program hopping can be very detrimental because you're never laying a baseline down long enough for the body to go. Oh, I see what he needs to do. Let's do it this way. We're allowing the adaptations to actually take place. Yeah, there's no adaptation. I mean, you know, and, and as you get older or stronger, I think six months is even pushing it. I would say even somewhere between eight and 12. Because, I mean, I would, I'll give you an example. And again, I, I hate throwing numbers because people get mad. Like, oh, he's a fucking, you know, he just talks about his numbers. I, it took me a year and a half to go from 1,055 to 1,080. What's the percentage of that? One percent, mm -hmm. something, maybe, maybe three. It's not much. Yeah, uh, and that took a year and a half. So eighteen months to go from a thousand fifty-five to ten eighty-five, dude. <laughs> so yeah. if you're already at a certain level, you better think six months. That's like a blink of an eye, most definitely. Because sometimes just getting back to where you were, yeah, is the bigger <laughs> battle. Yeah, yeah, and then. Um, so smaller movements. So, you know, well, Matt, how does tricep extensions or lat pull downs or rotator cuff, how does that transfer to big lifts? Um, if you do smaller lifts, they show to have great transfer to complex movements. And that was proven in 1965 and 66 by Bernstein and Donsky. And they talked about using basically isolated movements with complex movements, and they saw performance increases, which we both know. You get stronger at tricep pushdowns mm -hmm. in the right way, your bench is going to go up. And we, yeah, in the right way. Yes, that has to be yes. context, because yes. we just talked about that with the seminar. Yes, it's huge. So, it's huge. I got a pile of fucking trash over there. No, that works. <laughs> that works. We'll wrap this up. What's the best? How can people find you? What's the best way to get um, hold of you? Winningstrength.com is the, the website. You can find all of our online coaching. You can find uh, Patreon where I answer almost like, you know, every three to four hours questions on a direct message. Post a lot of the workouts that we do with the contracts. So you'll see what I do with mechanics that are working 50 hours a week on like diesels. So they're wore out, but they want to get better. 
what's the minimal dosage? You have to think minimal effective yeah. dosage at that point. Then you have like stuff that we do at the gym. And then you have like stuff I do with people that are 50 plus have never seen weights before and they just want some benefit. And we price that accordingly. So that one that's like, you know, hey, I'm 50. I want to start working out, but I don't have any base. I need simplistic movements, very marginal equipment. 10 bucks a month, mm -hmm. you know, um, we have tactical stuff. So on the tactical train heroic is the exact workouts that I give my fire departments based on what I see with guys that deadlift 225 all the way up to 500 dudes that bench 185 to 315. And every time we max, we all get better. And most importantly, their injury rates go down, which I think is, should be on people's timeline. If you're trying to be tactical or you're trying to do something outside of powerlifting, Sometimes you can talk injury prevention and nobody wants to hear it, but uh, by the time you're 35, you probably want to start hearing it. That's why when I did tactical work, when I worked with Border Patrol out of Tucson in 2015 and 16, they were retired special forces guys that already had a lot of miles on them, but they still wanted to be physically active to take people over the border. And so they had, their ears were like, tune the fuck up when I was talking anti-aging and recovery yeah. and making sure they're optimizing their training. So I think that's a huge population. You just hope to catch people before the mileage and the injury start to accumulate too much. So we do that on the tactical side. Then I have the conjugate side, which is a kind of a uh, relapse portion of what we're doing at the gym, but with videos next to it to make sure that you can not have to pay for online coaching, but you can see exactly what you're doing, clicking the video to make sure you can try to match your technique to what I'm showing. Yeah. So doing the tricep pushdowns, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like we talked right. about. So there's that. And then, you know, um, everything else can be found on the website for sure. All right. Well, we'll have a link in the description. I want to thank you for coming out. Yeah, dude. And we're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching the video to the end. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel and click here, 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 or here for more videos.